While I'm in jail, strangers is telling me, yo, you don't know? Biggie Homeboy shot you. Who shot y'all? the leak from the opposite. Leak hard to creep them Brooklyn streets. It's all nothing. Everybody that was involved knows what happened. And the rumors that's spreading is on some tip like we set them up. You know what I'm saying? And that's crazy. Be to yourself. Stay to yourself. Trust nobody. Trust nobody. Tupac versus Biggie. The greatest hip hop beef of all time. Two friends that became mortal enemies on their way to the top. In a deadly coastal war between the East Coast and the West Coast. Bad Boy Entertainment versus Death Row Records. A feud that took place in the mid 90s and changed the rap game forever. With the deaths of both of these icons in 96 and 97. These young men had a bright future ahead of them. But their lives were cut short and we unfortunately never got to witness the full extent of their greatness. Cause they were both in their mid 20s when they passed. And they are still regarded as two of the greatest rappers to ever do it. Before these two met, Tupac was already a star and Biggie was looking up to him. He himself was on the rise, trying to blow up in the rap game in order to get on Pac's level. Cause after Park left the group Digital Underground in the early 90s to go solo, his career as an actor and rapper took off. He dropped the album Tupacalypse Now in 1991 and was working on a sophomore album strictly from our NIGGAZ, which would come out on February 16th, 1993. He had also just starred in the movie Juice, which came out in January 92. And between April and July that same year, he had already filmed the next cult classic called Poetic Justice with Janet Jackson. Everyone knew that Park had a bright future ahead of him and that he was on his path to superstardom. He was planning to appear in more movies and go platinum with his next album. <laughs> we go platinum, nigga, we go platinum. Biggie, on the other hand, wasn't known outside of Brooklyn back in 92. He wanted to quit selling drugs and do music instead cause he began rapping in his early teens and had been battling people in Brooklyn ever since he dropped out of high school at the age of 17. His friends knew that he was destined for greatness. He couldn't continue living the life of a drug dealer and hustler. People in his circle were getting locked up left and right. But back then it was hard to make it as a rapper. You couldn't just go viral like these days on the internet and become a star overnight. You needed the right connections and tons of luck to get discovered. Being talented wasn't enough. After dropping out of school, he became more involved in crime. In 1989, he was arrested on weapons charges in Brooklyn and sentenced to five years probation. In 1990, he was arrested on a violation of his probation. And a year later, he was arrested in North Carolina for dealing crack cocaine for which he had to spend 9 months in jail before making bail. After his release, he finally made a demo tape, Microphone Murderer, while calling himself Biggie Smalls. It was produced by DJ 50 Grand. The local DJ Mr. C of Big Daddy Kane and Juice Crew Association discovered and promoted it, and thus it was heard by the Source Magazine's editor in 1992. In March that year, he was featured in the Source in the Unsigned Types section which was dedicated to airing promising rappers. The demo then made its way to Sean Puffy Combs, who at the time was an a and executive of Uptown Records. After hearing the tape, Puffy wanted to arrange a meeting with Biggie, hoping that it's someone with sex appeal like LL Cool J, who was a ladies man and player. But Biggie was far from a player at that time. He got signed to Uptown Records regardless on July 14, 1992. Puffy then put him on one of the songs on Heavy D's album, Blue Funk. Biggie also appeared on Supercat's Dolly My Baby and afterwards started recording his own records like Party and Bullish, for example, which ended up becoming his debut single. His flow and delivery on top of his impeccable pen game really made him stand out from the rest of the MCs. Those who witnessed him perform before the fame knew that he had a bright future ahead of him. But Uptown Records wasn't able to give him the promotion, attention and resources he needed to blow up as a rapper. Puffy was just an a and executive and the label had way too many artists to focus on Biggie. So Big and Puff needed a new strategy, a new plan, which ended up being a new record label, which Puffy would launch a year later with Biggie being the main priority. 
the main artist of the company. Until then, Biggie would try to get his name out there by performing on events and shows, meeting rappers, DJs, producers and respected people in the industry. One of the biggest names in hip-hop back then was Tupac. Biggie first met him in late 92, before Pac made the songs I Get Around and Keep Your Head Up, which would go gold a year later in 93, along with his upcoming sophomore album. Puffy had rented Biggie and his homies Dan Smalls and Groovy Lou convertible cars for their trip to LA. Big desperately wanted to meet Pac. He was a huge fan of him and knew that he was living somewhere in California. His homie Dan Smalls knew a drug dealer in LA who was also cool with Pac, who was willing to give him Pac's number. Big then went ahead and gave him a call to see if they can somehow meet up. Pac came to Biggie's hotel and they hung out together in the parking lot, sitting in Biggie's rented convertible, bumping music. Big played him a song he was working on at the time, Party and Bullish, which was produced by Easy Moby, who will play a huge role later on. Pac was one of the first people to hear it, cause the song hadn't come out yet. Pac really loved it and couldn't stop bumping it, and Big was flattered couldn't believe that Park liked one of his songs, one of the first ones he ever recorded. When Greg Nice from the group Nice and Smooth came downstairs, Park asked Big, yo, what else you gotta do today? Big then gave Dan Smalls a look like he wanted him to confirm that they have nothing planned, that they're free to do whatever Park wants to do. Dan knew that it would be a smart move to just cancel their entire schedule, to not miss out on the opportunity to spend time with Park. And Park was like, let's go to my house. So Park, Big, Greg Nice, Dan Smalls and Big stylist Groovy Lou all went to Park's house to hang out together, the same day they met. Once they had arrived, Park shared with them a big freezer bag of weed. He got them all high and then they started a cipher, freestyling back and forth. According to Biggie's former stylist Groovy Lou, they freestyled together for at least an hour and it was the most incredible freestyle he'd ever seen. You know, Tupac would freestyle for 5 minutes, then Big would come right back for 5 minutes, and Pac would be, you know, hyping Biggie up the entire time. And they would just be having the time of their lives. And there was so much of a respect factor between the two. After the freestyle session, Pac went into his room and pulled out his green army bag filled with hand and machine guns. They played around with the guns in Park's backyard, running around pretending to shoot each other. Park then walked in the kitchen and cooked some steaks for them. He also had fries, bread and Kool-Aid. Big and the rest of them were drinking and smoking. Park all of a sudden came back to the living room and said, yo, come get it. They ate together and continued having fun. This is where Park and Big's friendship started. I always thought it to be like a Gemini thing. We just clicked off the top and were cool ever since, Biggie said in the September 96 issue of the Vibe magazine. Park then introduced him to all his homies, including Big Stretch and Majesty from the Life Swords, who initially didn't like him because he was using the same name as one of their homies, a New York graffiti artist called Big Trick, who everyone called Biggie Smalls. He would always hang out with Park and was part of the Thug Life movement. It's the same Biggie Smalls that Tupac and Stretch dedicated the song called God Bless the Dead to after he passed away. Rest in peace to my motherfucker, Biggie Smalls. Stretch and Biggie became great friends after starting off on the wrong foot. Pac ironed things out and allowed Biggie to join the family. They rapped and freestyled together every time they hung out. And Pac was really impressed by Biggie's rapping skills. He wanted him to be successful as a rapper under his wing as one of his soldiers. He knew that Biggie had potential. The two even started traveling together. Park paid for Biggie's trips all around the US. When Big came to LA, he slept on Park's couch. And every time Park came to New York, they would meet up and throw dice with the guys from Biggie's neighborhood. Park bought him his first Rolex watch and even became his wingman when they tried to meet women at clubs and shows. Cause Park was very popular with girls, especially after appearing in the movies Juice and Poetic Justice and after dropping the hit single I Get Around, in which he boasts about his sexual conquests. Biggie wasn't a ladies man back then, the player image came after his success, 
and Pac was happy for him every time Biggie made progress career-wise. Like for example when they played the music video to the Bad Boy remix of Supercat's Dolly My Baby on TV in early 93, the version with Biggie and Puffy on it. Pac Stretch and Majesty saw it the first time it aired on TV and got excited, started yelling and screaming with joy when they saw Biggie's face on the TV, cause it marked his official recording debut when it was also the first music video he was in. I love it when you call me Big Pac, but the show stop, but the rock drop, but. They had gotten real close by this time. Pac was already working on his third album, which was supposed to be called Thug Style while Big was still struggling to get his foot in the music business. He was really fed up with Puffy at the time, cause he wasn't really making much progress career-wise. His girlfriend Jan Jackson was also pregnant with his daughter Tiana at the time, and Biggie needed the money desperately. He was tired of waiting for Puff to finally launch his new label, told Park that it's probably the best for him to go back to selling drugs, cause this rap thing wasn't working out for him. Park might have been the reason why Big changed his mind and didn't quit rapping. Cause he motivated him to hang in there, telling him that he's talented enough to become a star. And he also promised him that he'll take him on tours and shows, so that he can not only make a little bit of money until his deal with Puffy works out, but he could also use this opportunity to promote himself nationwide. Cause Park was performing in multiple states, while Big was only known in New York. So he was able to make a name for himself outside of New York and make a little bit of money on the side, while Park was covering all the costs for him, including hotel and transportation fees. Not only for him, but also for his homies. And Park would share the money he earned from those shows. He was the only one that was truly looking out for him. Puffy's support wasn't good enough to keep Biggie off the streets, at least prior to them launching their label, which was gonna be called Bad Boy Records. Yes, it's bad. Park wanted to help him until he starts selling units. They performed together on numerous shows and concerts. He let Biggie rap some of the songs he was working on, when nobody even knew who Biggie was. They used to book Park for all these shows all around the US and wanted him to perform a couple of his hits. Park would step back and let Biggie rap to put him on and to help him grow a following. He also did the same thing for Stretch. Stretch, Biggie and Park became a trio. He let Biggie open up his shows. Now imagine, Park had more fans in New York, in Brooklyn, in Biggie's own neighborhood than Biggie himself, cause he was a movie star with multiple hits. And a guy like that was willing to give a spotlight to Biggie. He had a large following and always wanted to put on his people. At the time he would perform with his group Thug Life. Park was the complete opposite of selfish. He wanted his people to be successful as well. He would bring absolute nobodies on stage to come perform with him. He would give his homies pocket money and pay their bills. Like from his best friend at the time Big Stretch for example. He would babysit Stretch's daughter and treat everybody like family. And he gave Biggie the same treatment. When the two got close, Park treated him like a little brother. Instead of promoting his own music while he was on stage, he would share his stage time with other artists like Biggie for example. And he himself wasn't a platinum artist yet. It wasn't like he was rich and super popular and could afford to miss out on promo. He himself at the time considered himself underground. But even then he tried to kickstart Biggie's career. Like you would expect an older brother to do for a sibling. A good example for this was the event in Maryland at the Bowie State University. Puck let Big Stretch and Majesty from the Life Squad open up the show. Afterwards it was Biggie's turn. And he performed Party and Bullish. Biggie even yelled Thug Life. Puck then jumped Biggie on stage during the part in the song Party and Bullish where the fight breaks out. They pretended to fight on stage. And then Biggie continued rapping. Park performed some of his unreleased music that night, songs that were supposed to appear on the album Thug Style, which unfortunately never came out. After the performance, there was a fight outside the venue involving Tupac and his clique. 
they were inside their van and ready to drive back to their hotel. But they were getting blocked and ambushed by a group of people throwing bottles at their van. Park and his people got out and chased them, beat up two of them. And then when the attackers came back, Park went back to the van to get his pistol. He started shooting in the air yelling, Thug life mother effer, saving Biggie and his crew since they were outnumbered and surrounded. The attackers then ran away and Park drove off before the cops came. On April 4th, 1993, Biggie and Park performed together at the Glam Slam nightclub in downtown LA. Notice how Puffy was already wearing bad boy merchandise months before launching the label. Puffy had been planning this since 1992. Biggie and Park also did an interview with Blackwatch TV together that same day at the Royal Hotel where they also did that iconic freestyle. I'm scared to do some freestyle. Blow. I'm too high and I might go off tempo. Money holes are closed. Blood smoke coming out the nose. It's all a nigga knows. Flipping off foes. Putting tags on toes. On April 20th, the Who's the Man movie soundtrack came out and peaked at number 32 on the Billboard 200 chart. The first song on the album was Biggie's Party and Bullish. So he was the first guy they heard when they played the album. That helped Biggie to slowly grow a following, especially when it got released as a single two months later. On May 3rd, 1993, Big and Park freestyled together live on stage at Trafalgar Square in New York. It was in Southside Jamaica, Queens. So as you can see in 93, the two were always performing together. That all started to change in 94 once Biggie started to grow as an artist. Biggie's debut single Party and Bullish then came out on June 29th. On July 23rd, Big and Park attended the release party for the movie Poetic Justice, starring Tupac and Janet Jackson. The two later performed at the Palladium in New York. Redman and Nas were there too. Shortly after that, Park, Biggie and Puffy shared a stage with Snoop Dogg, Warren G, Desk, Rob, Nate Dogg and the DOC, who were all Death Row affiliates at the time. In 93, there were plans of Tupac signing to Death Row. More on this in my documentary for the Dre and Park beef. Death Row was reaching out to him and they wanted to sign the group Thug Life to the label, which unfortunately never happened. But Big E got to meet all the giants in the industry before even having an album out, partly thanks to Park for taking him on shows. In mid-August, Uptown Records fired Puffy, and then a week later he launched his own record label Bad Boy Entertainment. Then on August 19th, 1993, Big E got signed to Puffy's new label, and they started working on his debut album Ready to Die. Before the release in 94, Biggie was concerned with how well the album would perform. Puffy's new record label hadn't proven itself yet. So Biggie asked Park to replace Puffy as his manager. He wasn't trusting him. Puffy wanted to be on all his records in the ad-libs and wanted to tell him which beats he should rap on and what type of songs he should make. Biggie initially had a hard time making music for the masses. He just wanted to be himself and make records for his people. But that wouldn't have sold any units, so he and Puffy were arguing a bit. And Biggie asked Park to be his manager instead. But Park convinced him that Puff knew what he was doing, saying, he will make you a star. Puff Daddy wanted Biggie to be the next Heavy D, an overweight rapper making funky dance and club songs but more street and more lyrical. Heavy D was a platinum rapper with multiple club hits. Puffy tried to mold Biggie and turn him into a sex symbol, even with him being overweight. He wanted him to make dance and pop music, which Biggie didn't want at all. He hated songs like Juicy and Big Papa, wanted to make hardcore lyrical street rap instead. But both Puffy and Park convinced him to give it a try and to add songs that will sell the album. In 93, Biggie was closer to Park than to Puff, but that changed over time. Biggie started to trust Puffy more and more, and Puff was always in his ear. Big also listened to Puck's advice and changed his style a bit, or at least tried to add more variety. Went from the hard and aggressive party and bullish, to smooth and less forceful songs like Big Papa, One More Chance and Juicy. Puck taught him things he learned about the industry how to market yourself and have a successful career, what to do to sell records, to not just fill your albums with hardcore and super lyrical joints, songs that only hardcore hip-hop fans will appreciate, but to also add club bangers, songs for the ladies, 
and tracks that get played on the radio to reach a wider audience. Told him that in order to be successful and popular, you need to make records for the ladies and not just for the men. Since according to Park, women buy more records and men just want what the women want. Meaning if the ladies love you and your music, then the men, especially the boyfriends, will try to be like you in order to be more like their girlfriend's celebrity crush. And they will of course buy your albums too. They'll consume your music as a couple. That was Park's strategy back then. Biggie respected him and really appreciated all the help and support he offered. Puck was something like a mentor to him. He got tons of advice which helped to shape him as an artist. Tupac was generous with his rap experience. And whenever Biggie and other up-and-coming rappers gathered at recording studios, he gave them advice on how to make a name for themselves. Biggie and other young rappers assembled in recording studios or hotel rooms to hear Tupac lecture about how to become successful. Puck could get up and get to teaching, Idi Amin from Tupac's group Outlaw said. Everyone was transfixed on this dynamic individual and soaking up all the information we could soak up. Puck devoted special attention to Biggie, grooming him and treating him like family. Biggie even told him that he'd like to be a part of Third Life. One of the biggest highlights in Biggie's career prior to his success was his performance at the Budweiser Superfest at Madison Square Garden on October 24th, 1993. He broke bread with some of the giants in the industry and showed off his skills on stage freestyling with Park, Big Daddy Kane, Scoop Lover and Shaheem. Biggie was still unknown at this point, but still managed to get the crowd hyped. Both Park and Big gave us an incredible performance. Their energy on stage was truly unmatched. It was one of the greatest freestyles in history. We're Brooklyn, we're Brooklyn, I thank the Lord for my many blessings. Behind the scenes, Tupac also talked to the producer Easy Moby, who Park knew worked on Biggie's upcoming album Ready to Die. According to Big, he was the one who introduced these two to each other. Biggie apparently always felt like Park's production was whack. He got to hear earlier versions of his third album and complained about his beat selection, thought that Park's production was holding him back. That's why he tried to work with different producers than him. Puck asked Easy Mo B for beats that day, and the two later started working together. Around the same time, they also started filming the movie Above the Rim, in which Tupac played the iconic character Birdie. The filming of the movie took place in New York from October to November 93, and Biggie occasionally paid him a visit at the movie set. Like I explained in my Dre and Puck beef documentary, Tupac decided to scrap his third album called Thurk Style. He had just finished recording it but decided to scrap it and start from scratch due to the people from Death Row getting copies of it prior to its release. Cause they used some of the ideas on Thurk style for Snoop Dogg's Doggy Style, which was just about to come out. And Biggie would also start to take ideas from him from that point on. Cause Puffy wanted him to compete with Snoop and Dr. Dre on the west coast. And Park had to reinvent himself once again like on every album. Cause he didn't want to sound like anyone else even though they were the ones biting him. So he decided to put more focus on his brand Thug Life by pushing his group, started working on the first volume of the Thug Life series. The turning point was in November 93 when Tupac started hanging out with a man named Haitian Jack. I covered their relationship in detail in my video The Reason Why Tupac Got Shot Five Times. Make sure to check it out. The two met on November 6th at the Scores nightclub in Manhattan, New York where they watched the Riddick Bow and Evander Holyfield boxing match. Puck came and hung out with him in the VIP room of Scores. Jack got him a bottle of Remy Martin and some Cuban cigars. Puck fell in love with his lifestyle and said, Wow man, this is the life. To which Jack responded, This is the life I live, but I don't bring attention to myself. I do what I do with my friends and that's it. He told Puck that they don't like people who shoot cops. Addressing the incident of Park shooting two off-duty police officers a week prior on October 31st, 1993. The best thing for you to do is to stay in the studio. Stay focused, do your music and come check me when you're free. Jack told him that he should reach out to him every time he's in New York. And Park said he'll do that. The two became close friends after that. Jack introduced him to some of the toughest Jamaican and Haitian dudes in Brooklyn. Including the record executive Jimmy Henchman who will play a huge role later on. Park learned a lot from them, 
meeting them changed him as a person. The boxer Mike Tyson was telling Park that he was out of his league hanging with Haitian Jack. But Park wouldn't listen. At the time, Jack had one foot in the music industry and one foot in the streets, hanging with his right-hand man Ricky Lee. Park used to dress in baggies and sneakers. Haitian Jack and Ricky Lee took him shopping and quote-unquote made him more mature by introducing him to all the gangsters in Brooklyn. This is the style that Biggie later supposedly copied from Park. But Park got that style from Haitian Jack. Park told Jack that he's glad that he met him, because it helped him with the movie character he was working on. The above the rim character Birdie was a New York gangster just like Haitian Jack. He wooed people through his flash and charisma. Park got a swagger from Jack. The way he handles himself, how everybody's always around him. That people gravitate to a gangster. According to Haitian Jack, Park was studying him to learn how a real gangster acts and behaves so that Park can improve his performance as a New York gangster in the movie. Jack even paid him a visit at the movie set of Above the Rim, where he gifted him a Rolex watch, and they went out and bought some jewelry together at the Diamond District on 47th Street at a place called Tito's Jewelry. Park was mesmerized by his flash and jewelry, so he wanted to get himself some of the same. Jack then took Park to a club called Nils, where he met a 19-year-old woman called Ayanna Jackson who would later accuse him of assault. Jack said, this girl wants to do more than just meet you. They danced and kissed together on the dance floor and she supposedly pulled down his pants, touched his private parts and got intimate with him in front of everybody. The two then left the club and Haitian Jack drove them to the Parker Meridian Hotel where they had intercourse. It was a $750 a night, 38 floor hotel suite with two bedrooms, one for Park and one for Haitian Jack. The next day, she gave Park her number and the two continued to meet up a couple of times to have intercourse. November 18th was the day that changed everything. Park had a show in New Jersey at Club 88 and they also went to the Above the Rim movie shoot. Afterwards, he went shopping with Jack and on their way back to the hotel, he asked Park, why don't you give her a call? So Park, Haitian Jack, a guy named Trevor, Park's manager Charles Fuller and Biggie were now waiting in the hotel room for Ayanna Jackson to arrive. As soon as she arrived, Biggie supposedly left and the whole incident with the assault happened. If you want more info on this incident, check out the video I previously mentioned about the Quad Studio shooting. I will only mention a couple of points for context. Park and Ayanna Jackson were in the bedroom alone when the other man entered and proceeded to assault her. Tupac then left the room after feeling weirded out by the group setting. He talked with his publicist in a different room, felt groggy and then went to sleep, as he had a long day behind him. He awoke to Ayanna Jackson yelling at him for more or less allowing them to assault her. She then went downstairs and informed the security about what's happened, saying that Park assaulted her. Tupac, Jack and Charles Fuller were arrested. Trevor somehow got away. The three were accused of committing that crime but Haitian Jack and Charles Fuller got off lightly, while Park became the main target, which of course infuriated him to the point that he publicly spoke on it. He asked interviewers how all those people got away even though they were the ones that committed the crime while he was asleep. What's also important for our story is that Biggie left his illegal guns at Tupac's hotel suite and then left as soon as Ayanna Jackson came in which seems kinda odd at first, but he himself tried to stay away from Haitian Jack, cause Biggie knew that he was a serious street cat that basically poisoned everything he touched. But from the outside it seemed like Biggie was always involved when Tupac got into trouble and somehow managed to get away every time, as if he knew something was about to happen. The assault wasn't the only charge Pac faced. Biggie unintentionally made his upcoming fight for freedom more difficult as Park was charged with weapons possession that same night, even though those were Biggie, Jack and Trevor's guns. Four guns with the serial numbers scratched out were found in Tupac's hotel room. Park obviously didn't want to snitch on Biggie, as it would not only ruin his career but it was also against everything Park stood for at the time. So he was forced to take that one to the chin and shut up about it. He spent much of 94 proclaiming his innocence. The fact that Biggie left exactly when Ayanna Jackson came in, that he was partly responsible for one of the charges Park faced, and that he was also in the same building when Park got shot a year later, gave Park enough reason to think that Biggie might be hiding something, and that he's not completely innocent. 
because it was coincidence after coincidence after coincidence. And Park later came to the conclusion that it was all done on purpose. All these weird coincidences would accumulate until Park finally had enough. And those wouldn't be the only things he disliked about Biggie. Park's grudge and frustrations with him grew over time. But the incident at the hotel was the beginning of it. Even if he was somehow able to shake off the abuse charges, the firearms in the hotel room were enough to get him locked up. They confiscated the guns and Puck was forced to fight for his freedom for the next year. In 94, he worked on a new version of his third studio album which he later called Me Against the World, while also working on the group album Thug Life and starring in the movie Bullet. Biggie, on the other hand, was focused on his debut album Ready to Die. Both did their separate things. They weren't really part of the same clique anymore. Puck had little to no involvement in Biggie's upcoming album and Biggie had no involvement in any of the albums Puck and Thurg Life were working on, aside from two songs which I will touch on later. Puck asked him if he still wanted to be part of the Thurg Life movement, now that they're actually putting out an album together. And Biggie, I don't want to say rejected the offer, but he made clear that he had his hands full with his own album and all the things Puffy wanted him to do. Puff was kinda trying to pull Biggie away from him so that they can focus on their own brand and build up Bad Boy together to the point that they can outgrow everyone in the game, including Tupac. Puffy would become his new mentor and Puck was now less of a teacher to him, but more of a rival in the rap game. Friendly competition. Someone who's not part of the Bad Boy movement. In March that year, both Tupac and Biggie once again performed together on stage at the new Regal Theater in Chicago. Biggie had his click Junior Mafia with him and Park came with Thug Life. This might have actually been their last stage performance together, cause in 94, Biggie and Park had their own tours and shows and started to focus on their brands and movements. Biggie stopped rapping the Thug Life movement at a time when Park was trying to put together the self-titled group album. They worked on it until May 94. Around that time, Biggie gave Park the demo for his upcoming album. It had the song Juicy on it. And Park loved it. He used to play it all day and also made his friends and family listen to it. He was really looking forward to hearing the final version of the album, which Biggie was planning to finish in the next couple of months. On August 4th, Biggie got married to the R&B singer Faith Evans, whom he had met eight days prior at a bad boy photo shoot. She will play a huge role in the story later on. Five days later, on August 9th, Biggie dropped the single Juicy, which is widely regarded as one of the greatest hip-hop songs of all time. And it was also a commercial success. You can hear a change in his style, and Park was fine with it at first, cause he was the one who had advised him to do so, that he should do more smooth and laid-back songs for the radio in order to sell the album. Biggie hated the song, but it actually became one of his biggest hits. That summer, he started performing songs from his upcoming album Ready to Die, and he grew a large following. His album was almost done. Six of the songs were produced by Easy Moby. No other producer produced that many songs for the album. And Biggie heard that Moby was working with Park too. He actually wanted that sound for himself. Get Moby to produce as many records as possible. So he got curious and wanted to know if he gave Park better beats than him. And indeed, Moby gave Park the beat for Temptations, which Biggie loved. It was a record similar to Big Papa. He was disappointed and mad that he gave Park those beats, cause he immediately knew that it would become a hit. And he wanted to be the hardest rapper in 94, jump on the hardest beats of the year. Biggie always felt like Park's beats were whack. And now, for Me Against the World, his friend Park finally gets some great production and Biggie complains, saying that Moby should have given those beats to him. Biggie approached Moby and said, Yo man, you know you were supposed to give me them joints. Moby then responded, What you talking about? I heard the joints you did with Park. You heard them? Yeah, man. Them joints is fire. You should have gave them to me. Moby took it as him joking around, but he probably did want those beats for himself. He probably regretted introducing those two to each other. Biggie was kinda disappointed in Moby as they had been tied since the beginning of his career ever since he produced Big's first single Party and Bullish in 92. Mo B had become one of the main producers for Bad Boy Records. 
he had played a huge role for the first two albums released on the label. The biggest song they made at the time was Flavor In Your Ear, from his label mate Craig Mack, who Big was kinda competing with at the time. And Moby was the producer of that record. It went platinum in just a couple of months and became one of the biggest records of 94. Big was already kinda jealous that Moby gave Craig Mack that beat. And now he's giving all these bangers to Puck, even though he and Moby had been cool from day one. He knew him way before Moby met Puck and Craig Mack, and Big was holding him in such a high regard. He was one of his favorite producers. But he felt like none of the Moby beats on his album could compete with the ones he gave Puck and Craig Mack, especially Temptations and Flavor in Your Ear. Cause he would later convince Puffy to let him get on the remix of Craig Mack's song, and he didn't even like him. That's why he dissed him on the remix, on his own song. Big and Moby's relationship wasn't the same after that. They didn't collaborate as much as they used to. On his second album, which he would drop two and a half years later, Moby only produced two songs out of 25, when on the previous album he had produced the highest amount of tracks. As a friend, he should have been happy that Park finally gets some great production. He finally gets the beat you like and you don't want to give him that. There was definitely competition between the two. They wanted to put out the better album. Ready to Die vs Me Against the World. Moby also gave Park the beats for If I Die Tonight, which became the second track on Me Against the World, Straight Ballin' for the Thug Life album, My Black for the show soundtrack, and another one called Out on Bail, which never got officially released. He would also get the beat for Running from the Police. Biggie was mad that Park got all those beats, cause Park had never worked with Moby before. He only knew him because of Biggie, and Biggie wanted that sound for himself. Biggie and Park talked about it and agreed to do the song Running from the Police together, cause originally Biggie wasn't supposed to be on it. The song was supposed to land on either the Thug Life group album or on Me Against the World. It was recorded on August 12, 1994 at the Unique Recording Studios in Times Square, New York. Moby was scheduled to put the song together with Park and his click. He didn't expect to see Biggie and Junior Mafia walk in and jump on the track. At the time, Park had kinda accepted the fact that Biggie is no longer part of the Thug Life movement. Biggie was no longer one of his soldiers. He had ranked up to a general and had his own team. But upon Biggie's request, they wanted to make a last minute addition, so that Biggie gets credited as an honorable member of Thug Life, which unfortunately never happened, as the song never made it onto a Tupac album. Pac was also unhappy with his verse, probably because Biggie outshined everybody on the track, with his raw delivery, energy and outstanding flow. So he redid his verse and that's why there are two Tupac verses for this one song. They also recorded the track House of Pain together, which featured Big Stretch, and it was supposed to be on Biggie's album Ready to Die, but it later got scrapped. DJ Eddie F also invited both Park and Big to jump on the track Let's Get It On, along with the rappers Heavy D, Spunk Bigger and Grand Puba. It landed on the same title album which came out in October 94. Aside from the House of Pain recording session, Biggie and Puffy never invited Tupac to come record with him, even though Puck had helped to shape and promote him. There is a rumor that Puffy didn't want Puck to be part of the album because of the Ayana Jackson assault case. And then there's another rumor which suggests that Puffy didn't want these two to get too close. They treated him like a stepping stone after all the things he did for them. Both Big and Puck had a project coming out that following month, September 94. Biggie is ready to die on September 13th and Park's Thug Life album on September 26th. Park believed that his album would be more successful since Biggie is a newcomer. But Ready to Die ended up being more successful than all the albums he had released so far, including the Thug Life album. It peaked at number 15 on the Billboard 200, selling 57,000 units in the first week. The sales skyrocketed in the following months. But even in the beginning, he was selling more than the group he left behind, cause Thug Life sold way less and only managed to peak at number 42. It took Ready to Die only two months to go gold, while it took Thug Life 16 months. It performed worse than Park's second album. 
Ready to Die shifted attention back to the East Coast, at a time when West Coast hip hop dominated the charts. Before the release of that album, Park was always super excited and supportive. Every time he heard about Biggie reaching certain milestones, he was happy for him. Like for example when he got an invitation to Biggie's Ready to Die album release party in New York. Park bought all his friends and family members plane tickets to not miss the event, telling them that they need to be there to show support. He was happy and proud like a supportive older brother that cheers on his sibling during a game show, sitting in the audience hoping that his little brother will win. His excitement turned into disappointment once he actually had a copy of the album in his hands. He was expecting Biggie to show love to him in the liner notes, at least one little shout out or mention. But it didn't happen, almost as if Park was never part of Biggie's road to success. He started to get mad at Biggie for using his ideas for the album without giving him credit, cause he was fine with him taking his advices but expected at least a shout out. He thought Biggie was being ungrateful. He would only thank him when talking in private, but he wanted the whole world to know that he was there for him. Park was always trying to merge West Coast and East Coast sound on his albums, to give people the best of both worlds. He felt like his main selling point is that he's something like a bridge between East Coast and West Coast hip hop, one of the few artists in the game that can do both styles at the same time. And he felt like Biggie tried to do the same on Ready to Die. Not only that, but the overall theme of the album was supposedly copied from the first version of Me Against the World. The title of the album, Ready to Die, obviously suggests that it revolves around death. And Park was one of the only rappers in the game who was obsessed with that topic. He talked about death in dozens of his songs, even before Me Against the World. Hey yo, are you afraid to die? For the God, I've been ready to die. I'm ready to die, and nobody can save me. Even the ones on the final version of the Me Against the World album. If I Die Tonight, So Many Tears, Death Around the Corner. And those are just the ones he kept on the album after changing it because of Biggie. The ones that didn't make the cut are either unreleased to this day or landed on his posthumous album Are You Still Down, Remember Me. He always talked about dying, getting killed, was prophesizing his own death. Saying things like I'm ready to die or I see death around the corner like on the song Death Around the Corner of the Me Against the World album. Now Biggie all of a sudden raps, sometimes I hear death knocking at my front door. On the song Everyday Struggle on the Ready to Die album, I see death around the corner, I hear death knocking at my front door. Park noticed the similarities and was a bit confused. Also the part where he said F the world in the song Ready to Die, after Park played him the song F the world from his upcoming album Me Against the World. Then on the song Big Papa they use the same sample from the Isley Brothers as on Park's song Time to Get My Drink On, which Park wanted to put on his scrapped album Thurk style. So the idea to one of the biggest hits on Biggie's album came from Park. And he couldn't even use the song since he scrapped the album after Dr. Dre from Death Row sabotaged him and used his ideas for the Doggy Style album. More on that in the Dr. Dre beef documentary. Biggie and Puffy were doing the same thing as Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg. So Park obviously felt some type of way about it. Even the beat selection was similar. Cause as mentioned earlier, Easy Mo B worked on both albums. He produced 6 songs for Biggie's album and 6 for Park. But Park made the wise decision to split them up. To make sure that the projects don't sound too similar. As every producer has his own distinct sound. According to Stretch's brother Majesty, Park was also upset about Biggie using his baby baby ad lib on Juicy. <laughs> He also spoke on this in the year 1996 when he was interviewed by Sway. I was dead 
got trained and they used to be under me like my lieutenant. I used to come to New York. I used to do shows and let them come on before I didn't keep your head up and get around. Because mm-hmm. nobody knew the in New York. Mm-hmm. And I used to tell them, yo, if you want to make your money, I'm, I'm, you got to rap for the bitches. Do not rap for the bitches. Yeah. I told them, don't rap for the bitches. Rap for the bitches. The bitches are body records and the bitches with the bitches want. So all of a sudden, he changed from being listened to a party and booze. Listen to his style. He changed from that to Big Pop yep. because of me. He had my album, Me Against the World, was the second one. He had the first one. I changed everything because Ready to Die came out and it sounded like my album. All my album was about, you know, dealing with death. Mm-hmm. And then he came out Ready to Die and I had to switch it. That's why it was less East Coast rap, East Coast beats because Biggie had just took my shit. That's what, but you could listen to it. That's what, that, that was a success too because he took like listen. West Coast sound. We flipped and, it. And I, I told him that. I told you know, him that I trained. He was supposed to be, he was supposed to be thug life. Mm-hmm. All while he was coming up, I used to let him come on stage with me. He was screaming thug life. Hey, cause I he was like, I hate Brooklyn, I hate New York, I'm buying with the puppy cheating me, woo, woo, woo. All of a sudden, he blew up, and he wasn't saying thug lies. So I started getting mad, and I was seeing him in this place, he was hugging me, yo, pop, yo, thank you, zone, you know, woo, woo, woo. Then he addressed it again in the 96 Vibe interview. Study. Go back and study. Study how party and bullshit was me before I met Biggie. You don't hear my style in this rap. Study out after I met Biggie, ready to die, come out, his whole style changed. Study. Make sure the rolling and anything is in the full effect and brand new Versace. Pac was also mad at him for rapping about things that he himself bought for him when Biggie had nothing, since he was broke. Like for example, his Rolex watch, his designer clothes, and he also started rapping about popping champagne. Something that The Roots, Raekwon the Chef and Ghostface Killer made fun of later on. I spoke on this in my Biggie vs. Nas, Wu-Tang and The Roots video. It's like these yeah. happy-go-lucky when they get on, man. They want to pop a little, a little champagne. Well, like I said, you know you what I'm saying? Every, few, every, every time you see him. Pac was mad because he was the one who always bought him champagne in Hennessy. But Biggie got all the credit for popularizing that lifestyle, even though he was technically rapping about the things that Pac introduced him to. Biggie supposedly never knew the taste of champagne before meeting Pac. He would even pay for Junior Mafia's transportation fees since Biggie was broke. So he wasn't the wealthy player he rapped about in his lyrics. At least not yet. But on the album he was rapping about his lavish lifestyle. Basically the life Tupac was living. Cause he was the player, not Biggie. According to Park, he used to beg women to sleep with Biggie. So that he doesn't come off as a loser who has to go home all alone after going to the club to meet some women with his homies, while everyone is returning to their hotel rooms accompanied by women. He said Biggie was the least popular guy in the group when it came to women. So now the same guy is pretending to be a player. Biggie was still his homie, so he didn't want to say all these things to his face. But that's what Park had in the back of his head the whole time. He held a grudge against him without Biggie knowing not realizing that Biggie changed his style because of him. He wouldn't have made player songs if Park hadn't encouraged him to do so. So it didn't really make sense for him to get mad at that, cause Biggie only did what Park told him to do. But the part that Park is right about is that he should have gotten his credit. And that's probably what upset Park the most. Where is the goddamn credit? Don't just say thank you in private, say it in public. The two are still cool with each other, but Park started to lose a little bit of respect and love for him. But him not getting a thank you, a shout out or mention really rubbed him the wrong way. He also didn't like how Method Man is the only feature guest on the album. How did Meth make the album, but the guy who opened doors for him didn't? The guy who inspired him the most. So Park was obviously disappointed. He had zero involvement in the album as if he never existed. Nothing that can be traced back to him. The inspiration part and him taking ideas is all debatable, at least in the public eye. You would have came off as a hater if you called him out on that. You take my ideas, my slangs, my styles, my ad-libs, my themes. You kickstart your career by using the wisdom I shared with you about how to make it in the game. I take you on tour, on all the shows, put some money in your pocket, pay all your fees, let you sleep on my couch, feed you, introduce you to women, consider you part of the family. And I can't even get a thank you in your liner notes? Am I asking for too much? It's something that only takes 5 seconds. You even stopped shouting out Thug Life now that you're famous. As if we were only a stepping stone to you on your way to the top. 
That's how Park felt. He had to bite his tongue. There was nothing he could do about it. Big and Park had two completely different personalities. Cause Park always gave props to the people who helped him or inspired him. And he always tried to work with people who were a big influence to him. Like Ice Cube for example. On his second album he had a song called Last Words. He put Cube on there as he was one of his biggest inspirations. That was Park's way of saying, yo, these are the people that got me into this game. And Park thought Big would put him on his album in a similar way. But Big didn't tell him that they never intended to put the song House of Pain on there. Let's say the song wasn't good enough for the album. Why didn't Biggie and Puffy invite him to more studio sessions? With Park's work ethic they could have easily recorded a whole album worth of songs. I mean, no other rapper at the time was as close to the bad boy camp as Park. Puffy supposedly tried to cause a rift between Biggie and Park. So that Big can focus on bad boy. Cause as mentioned earlier, Biggie stopped rapping and promoting Thug Life. He used to yell Thug Life every time he performed on stage. Cause once bad boy took off, he stopped doing that. And he didn't want to be part of the whole movement anymore. Park's biggest worry was that Junior Mafia would become bigger than Thug Life. Biggie told him that his next plan was to put out a Junior Mafia group album, similar to Tupac's Thug Life. So he was kinda using Park's blueprint. First he becomes successful and then he puts on his group. Not only that, but even the name of the group was inspired by Park. Park used the backronym for his group Thug Life. The hate you gave little infants F everybody. Biggie did the same for the Mafia in Junior Mafia, which stands for Masters at Finding Intelligent Attitudes. So both group names were based on backronyms. Both groups were also signed to the label Atlantic. They didn't get signed to Bad Boy. Cause just like how Park had full control over Third Life, Biggie wanted to be in full control over Junior Mafia, without people like Puffy being able to interfere. He started to put his focus on them, taught them how to rap, how to sound fresh and unique. Mentored them just like how Park mentored Biggie. So he had his hands full. He also had to promote his album Ready to Die, so that it can go platinum. He performed on shows and also shot multiple music videos for upcoming singles. Tupac couldn't be part of any of it, cause he had his court hearings to deal with. While at the same time trying to earn enough money to cover all the fees. He did shows, went to the video shootings for the movie Bullet and was also trying to record as much music as possible so that the label Interscope has enough material to release in case that he does get locked up for a couple of years. The two just started to drift further and further apart with their rise to fame and they saw each other less and less cause they both had their own shows, their own movements and their own projects. They would only see each other on rare occasions. Park didn't really get the opportunity to express his frustrations too big. When it came to friends, he was the type to bottle up his real emotions and feelings. Every time he wouldn't receive the same level of love he would give. While building up resentment and disappointment until he finally explodes. He was usually outspoken and direct. But when it came to friends and family, he would always try to endure it and not make a fuss about it. Just out of love, loyalty and companionship. You could say that in 93, Park and Big were as close as brothers, but in 94, as close as cousins who would only see each other on rare occasions. And their relationship would only grow colder and colder from that point on. In October 94, Bad Boy released a remix to Craig Mack's gold hit Flavor In Your Ear, featuring the legend LL Cool J, Busta Rhymes, Rampage and Biggie, who completely outshined everybody on the track and proved that he's a force to be reckoned with, a legend in the making. A man who's reaching for the crown. The number one spot. The title King of New York. The game was shaken up and Flavor In Your Ear would go platinum in the following month. So this was a huge push for him. Up until this point, not even Park had a platinum hit out. Around the same time there were also some new developments in the Ayana Jackson assault case. Haitian Jack's trial was separated from Park's, even though it was the same case. Which made Park think that Jack snitched on him and is trying to push the blame onto him. But according to Jack, the separate case came from Park's gun charges, for which Biggie was partly responsible for. Cause those were his guns. They didn't hold Jack accountable for the guns as the hotel suite was booked under Tupac's name. So they separated the case to not include the gun charges. Jack never admitted that one of those guns was his. 
so Park had to explain why he had four illegal guns in his room, without snitching on anybody. Jack always denied being a snitch. His case never went to trial. He ended up pleading out, took a misdemeanor charge and paid a thousand dollar fine. The other guy Trevor was never found, so the people who actually abused her got away while Park was metaphorically thrown in front of a pack of hungry wolves, even though he wasn't the one who actually abused her. And those weren't his guns. Those were Biggie, Trevor and Jack's guns. So they all got away. None of them stepped forward and said, wait a minute, don't blame Tupac, that was my gun. I take full responsibility. Instead, Biggie, Jack and Trevor turned their backs on him and let him fight those hungry wolves all by himself for something that Biggie, Trevor and Jack were responsible for. And because of the code of the streets, Tupac couldn't just snitch on them. So he felt like everyone stabbed them in the back. But Biggie was always apologetic, so Tupac forgave him. According to Tupac's brother-in-law Zaid, Park told Tation Jack to his face how he felt about Tim getting a separate trial. He allegedly said it in front of Zaid, Stretch, Jack and a couple of other people. Told them that he doesn't want to have anything to do with him anymore. And Haitian Jack sat there, looking at him with a quote-unquote humble look on his face. But Zaid apparently knew that Jack was mad. Jack was a dead friend to him, would try to holler at him at clubs. Tupac would just ignore him and continue doing what he does. Cause on November 4th, Tupac and Biggie attended Puff Daddy's birthday party at Roseland Ballroom. They hadn't seen each other in a while and hugged on stage. Stretch was there too. They all had a great time until Haitian Jack joined the party. Puck was upset that Biggie and Puffy invited him after all the things he did. I was hurt. I'm going to trial, I'm probably going to get convicted, and this guy is showing up at a party with champagne. Hanging with Biggie. He thought Jack was a snitch who's trying to push the blame onto him, after getting a separate trial for the same assault case. The accuser Ayanna Jackson didn't even care about Jack getting punished. Her main target was Tupac. So he thought Ayanna Jackson and Haitian Jack set him up. Cause they got into this mess because of Jack, and now Jack is getting away with Ayanna Jackson not caring about who supposedly assaulted her. Biggie got away from that situation in time and said it was all a coincidence. But then they invited Jack to the party. So Puck was confused. Seeing Haitian Jack at the party ruined his mood. Biggie then told Puck to stay away from him and to not hang around with him. Puck then asked, what do you mean? And Biggie responded, I'll tell you later. And the two never had a chance to finish the conversation cause Jack came and reached out his hand to Park in an attempt to greet him and Park just walked away. This was blatant disrespect. Even enemies acknowledged each other's presence and disrespecting someone like Haitian Jack was dangerous. In the September 96 issue of the Vibe magazine, Biggie indirectly spoke about this conversation and Park's relationship with Haitian Jack. There's ish that mother effers don't know. I saw situations and how ish was going down and I tried to school the guy. I was there when he bought his first Rolex, but I wasn't in the position to be rolling like that. I think Tupac felt more comfortable with the dudes he was hanging with, because they had just as much money as him. With they, Biggie means Haitian Jack and his people. And with school him, he means warn him about him. Now this is the part that a lot of people close to Big and Park debate about. And it also might have been part of the reason why Park suspected Biggie of having something to do with the Quad Studio shooting, which happened a couple weeks later. Biggie supposedly got robbed by Haitian Jack's people in Autumn 94, before the Quad Studio incident. But we don't know exactly when it happened, as Biggie tried to hide it from the public. Some people think that that's what he wanted to tell Park at Puffy's birthday party, before Haitian Jack came and interrupted their conversation. But that would mean that Biggie got robbed before he even warned Park about him, and it wouldn't make sense for Puffy to invite him to that party. Unless A, he didn't know about it, implying that Biggie kept it a secret from him, or B, he wanted to stay cool with Haitian Jack and his people to not upset them. Cause in 96, Puck said multiple times that they got Puffy under extortion. The rapper Lil Sean argued that Biggie felt like he got robbed because of Tupac as he supposedly went and told Haitian Jack in a joking way that Biggie wants him to stop hanging out with him, which supposedly infuriated Jack and made him tell his people to go rob Biggie shortly before the Quad Studio shooting, 
meaning between November 4th and November 30th. Biggie was told by the people who robbed him that Park notified Jack about him telling Park to stay away from him. That's how Big supposedly knew that it was Haitian Jack's people who came after him, and that it was because of Park. So Big was mad that Park put him on blast. But Park was not even on speaking terms with Jack anymore, so he couldn't have told him about it. Especially not in a joking way, cause Park was in no mood to joke around with Haitian Jack after the whole thing with the separate trial. Park was always trying to ignore him and walk away instead of talking to him. Maybe Jack found out from somebody overhearing their conversation at Puff Daddy's birthday party. Or he overheard the conversation himself. Park might have assumed that Biggie tried to set him up at the Quartz Studios in retaliation for getting him robbed by Haitian Jack's people. But this could only be possible if Biggie got robbed after Puffy's birthday party. But if that's the case, then why did Biggie try to warn Park about Haitian Jack? Cause they used to hang out together all the time. Haitian Jack, Biggie and Park. What did all of a sudden change for Biggie to warn him? And why was he still invited to the birthday party? There are tons of open questions and nothing makes sense. The robbery before the Quad Studio shooting is a well-kept secret. It was never reported to the police and everybody pretended like it didn't happen. So that's why people don't really bother to speak on it. We might never get the answer on when and why exactly Biggie got robbed and if Park was really responsible for it. But in November, things didn't really look too good for Park, as he was informed that he will most likely lose the case and go to prison. Unless, of course, a miracle happens. He was also running out of money as the lawyer fees were getting too much for him to handle. And he was too proud to ask Biggie and Puffy for financial support. Cause Biggie was on the rise and Bad Boy was taking over. Despite the relatively low first week sales, Biggie went gold in just two months. Meaning on November 15th, 1994. So not only did Biggie sell more records in the first week than Park, but he also went gold in a shorter amount of time. It took Park's second album seven months to go gold, and he only sold 38,000 units in the first week, while Biggie shipped 57,000 units. Not only that, but Biggie's single Juicy went gold as well. That same month on November 8th, took him only three months since the single came out on August 9th. So Biggie was catching up to Park in a very short amount of time. Park had three gold plaques, and Biggie had two, even though his first album came out just two months ago. Park, on the other hand, had three movies, two studio albums, and one group album. Biggie was just getting started. Park's latest album wasn't performing as well as he had anticipated. It didn't go gold until 96, and the singles received no certifications. Oh, and Craig Mack's Flavor In Your Ear also went platinum on November 22nd. And Biggie was on the remix, so it seemed like Biggie achieved everything Park had to work for in the past three years in just the span of a couple of months. It was like he played the game of rap on easy mode, while Park played it on hard. On November 29th, a Manhattan jury had convened to deliberate charges of sodomy, abuse and weapons possession against Tupac and his road manager and co-defendant Charles Fuller. After the first day of deliberations, Tupac was interviewed in front of the courthouse and asked about the allegations. Regarding the gun charges, Tupac denied that the firearms they found in the hotel were his. They couldn't find his fingerprints on them. And Park told the interviewer that they should go after the other people that were in the hotel room instead of focusing only on him, since the guns weren't his. He sarcastically asked the interviewers where the other people that were with him are at basically asking them to go after Biggie, Haitian Jack and Trevor, who were actually the ones that owned those illegal guns. Where are those people that did this? They were all in the same hotel as me. They were all right in the same room as me. Why am I the only one in court right now? Why is the cameras all on me? Why would I come to New York and be unlawfully owning two guns? Who has two guns? But who carries two unlegal guns? After the interview, Park left for a publicity stop in Harlem, recorded a song with a New York DJ named Ron G and then drove to the Quad Studios in Times Square, where he was supposed to record a song with a rapper named Little Sean, for which he was supposed to get $7,000 from one of Puffy's associates named Jimmy Henchman, who Haitian Jack introduced him to. At 12.16 a.m., meaning on November 30th, Park and his entourage of three people, his best friend Big Stretch, his manager Freddie Moore and his brother-in-law Zay Turner, arrived at the Quad Studios and were greeted by Lil C's and Chico Del Vec from Biggie's group Junior Mafia, 
who were standing on a small terrace on the 10th floor of the Quad Studio building. Junior Mafia and Biggie were actually recording the song Player's Anthem together for the upcoming album Conspiracy. This was shortly after the group got signed. They saw Park and his group in front of the building and screamed down to say hello. They both loved and looked up to him, welcomed him every time he came to Brooklyn. Park recognized Little C's who told him to come up and hang out with them on the 10th floor. Biggie and the members of the group Junior Mafia had no clue that Park was coming. Cause they were supposed to record on different floors and different studios. Park's plans of recording music with Little Sean were spontaneous. Biggie and Junior Mafia on the other hand had the studio sessions booked for their upcoming album weeks in advance. It was actually Jimmy Henchman who called Park to come up to the studio. They came to an agreement that Park would record one song with Little Sean and then leave. He was an hour late to the recording session and had just argued with Jimmy Henchman on the phone. They were cussing each other out and were mad at each other. So he was in a bad mood. Seeing his homie Little C's there calmed him down a bit. Cause he assumed if things go south, he got his homie Biggie and Junior Mafia there to help him out. Little C's on the other hand thought that Park came to the studio to see Biggie and hang out with him as a way to congratulate him and help him with his upcoming Junior Mafia album. But he was scheduled to record on the 8th floor. And Park thought that Little C's and Biggie were on the same floor hanging out with Little Sean and Jimmy Henchman. So when Little C's told him to get around the building and that he'll come get him, Park agreed thinking that Little C's would bring him to Little Sean and Jimmy Henchman. Quad had recording studios and equipment on 5 different floors at the time. Biggie and Junior Mafia were on a different floor than Puffy who had just came back from the video shoot for the song Warning. He supposedly wanted to say hello to his friend and mentor Andre Harrell, who was also on the 8th floor waiting for Park. Puff was supposedly there to keep an eye on Biggie and see what they're cooking up in the studio. But he didn't know at what floor they were recording. So he got to the 8th floor to check where they are. He then got caught in a conversation with his mentor Andre Harrell and Jimmy Henchman. And according to Puff Daddy's bodyguard Gene Deal, Jimmy told him that Puck is going to get dealt with. Puff either saw the robbers at the lobby when he came inside the building or he stayed on the 8th floor for over 20 minutes. Cause that's how long the robbers were waiting for Puck at the entrance of the quad studios according to the robber Dexter Isaac himself. Puck and his homies were now walking around the building and Little C's went back inside to inform Biggie and everyone else. Big was happy to hear that Puck was there and told Little C's to go get him. Chico stayed upstairs but C's got into the elevator with Nino Brown, another member of the group. Back on the street, as Tupac and others approached the entrance to the Quad Studios, they could see a man outside wearing boots and army fatigues. Puck thought that he was part of Biggie's security, cause he had seen Biggie's homies from Brooklyn wear army fatigues before. And the three robbers were indeed from Brooklyn. The leader Dexter Isaac and his two homies Spencer Bowens and George Roland Campbell aka Spunk and JD. And according to Dexter Isaac, he was friends with Biggie. Not only that, but he admitted that Biggie saw him at the Quad Studios about half an hour before Park arrived, when Dexter went inside the building up to the 8th floor with a man named Pauly to talk to the mastermind behind the robbery, which was Jimmy Henchman. Biggie was supposedly sitting on a sofa talking to Little C's, but Dexter also said that Puffy was on the same floor, even though according to Little C's, they didn't even know that Puffy was in the same building that day. So there are a lot of contradictions here. According to the robber himself, Biggie was there together with Puff. And Puffy knew about the plan of the robbery, cause the first thing Dexter Isaac did when he saw Jimmy Henchman in the Quad Studios was to ask him, how many people know what's about to go down? And Jimmy replied, he knows, nodding his head in Puffy's direction. Puffy supposedly looked Dexter dead in the eye and that's when Dexter knew that he was involved. But according to Puffy, he wasn't even there half an hour before the shooting. He was filming the music video to the song Warning, saying that this conversation with Andre Harrell on the 8th floor only lasted a couple of minutes. Cause he wanted to go up to the 10th floor to see Biggie. But this doesn't make sense either. Cause again, according to Puff, he arrived a couple minutes before Tupac. But the robbers were standing right there waiting for over 20 minutes. This would mean that Puffy saw them, cause he must have passed them when going inside the building. He probably even saw their faces. But let's say Dexter Isaac's version is true and Puffy's version is wrong. Then he must have arrived before the robbers. 
meaning 30 minutes before the shooting. Then it would make sense for Dexter Isaac and Puffy to see each other on the 8th floor, with Puffy spending a half an hour there with Andre Harrell and Jimmy Henchman. But he also said that Biggie and Lil C's were on the same floor sitting on a couch. On the 8th floor, not on the 10th floor. That doesn't make sense either since we know for sure that Lil C's and Biggie were on the 10th floor. And Lil C's was just taking a break from a long recording session. Went outside on the balcony on the 10th floor. So Dexter Isaac is trying to convince us that Lil C's and Biggie chilled on the 8th floor with Puffy but then took the elevator to the 10th floor to record some music, with Puffy staying on the 8th floor even though he wanted to see Biggie. And after 10 to 20 minutes of work, Little C's had to take a break and go on the balcony. This guy Little C's must be lazy as hell. He just needs a break after 10 minutes. Cause that's around the time when Tupac came and saw him on the balcony. But yeah, none of the stories add up. Someone is lying. Maybe all of them. But we can say one thing for sure. Puffy either saw the robbers at the entrance, or he saw Dexter Isaac on the 8th floor. Depending on who's telling the truth. The fact that he invited Haitian Jack to his birthday party, while also hanging out with Jimmy Henchman at the same place Tupac got lured into, knowing that Puck was about to get dealt with, with him admitting in the Vibe magazine that the shooting happened because of a beef with someone else, meaning Jimmy Henchman, the same guy that admitted to everything, while continuing to do business with him afterwards and refusing to inform Tupac prior or even after the shooting about the setup, this proves Puffy's claims of having nothing to do with the robbery and being completely innocent, as he knew exactly what was going to happen, with Dexter Isaac and Jimmy Henchman confirming it, and Puffy thus being guilty by association and guilty for not intervening and taking action when help was needed. Cause this incident could have easily been prevented or avoided if Puffy had just reached out to Puck. The assailant Dexter Isaac confessed everything in his book and has since then apologized to Tupac's family. And after Jimmy Henchman's arrest, he admitted to everything Dexter Isaac said. But anyway, back to the shooting. Puck and his homies are now standing in front of the building. He sees one of the guys outside wearing army fatigues and immediately thinks that that's Biggie's homie since they would wear similar clothes every time they hung out together. He saw another guy inside wearing army fatigues as well. And Little C's and Chico were on the other side of the building. So Park thought Biggie has the whole building locked down. He has his security and his homies everywhere. He felt safe. But he found it weird how the guys in army fatigues didn't greet him. One of them was outside leaning against the wall of the quad studio building. And another one was inside pretending to read the newspaper. The third guy, Dexter Isaac, was behind Tupac and his group. So Puck goes inside and the moment he presses the elevator button, Dexter Isaac's homies pull out their guns on them, while Dexter is at the door looking out for cops. Puck supposedly shot himself in the groin in the attempt to catch the robbers off guard and shoot at them before they can react. And there were supposedly four more shots by the robbers. All we know is that Puck's manager, Freddie Moore, was also hit in the stomach. All witnesses have made conflicting statements on who pulled the trigger, on how many shots were fired, and on how many times Park got hit. He either got shot once by himself and then pistol whipped, or shot five times, once by himself and then pistol whipped. Big Stretch and Dexter Isaac claimed the former, that Park was only shot once. Park and his brother-in-law Zaid claimed the latter, that he was shot five times even though Puck at first thought that he only got shot once. But the doctors supposedly told him that he got shot five times. I broke this down in detail in my video for the Quad Studio shooting. I included every interview and every statement about this incident. So make sure to check it out for further information. Cause I broke it down from everyone's point of view, so that you can form your own opinion on it. Lil C's and Nino Brown came down the elevator and Nino supposedly heard multiple shots. When the elevator doors opened, they saw everyone on the ground and Puck was getting stomped out by one of the robbers. The second guy, who kept an eye on Stretch, Freddie Moore and Zaid, then yelled at Little Caesar and Nino Brown, ordering them to go back up. The two were in shock and scared to death. The robbers then took most of Puck's jewelry, but left the Rolex watch that Haitian Jack had gifted to him. To leave a message. Don't mess with Haitian Jack. That was the message. Cause Puck had disrespected him in the daily news calling him a hanger-on. 
after he got that separate trial. So Haitian Jack's friend, Jimmy Henchman, wanted to teach him a lesson. Especially after Park cussed him out on the phone while he was on his way to the Quad Studios. So now, both Park and Big got robbed by the people close to Haitian Jack. Little C's then went back to the 10th floor where Biggie and the rest of the group Junior Mafia were recording music and told them that Park is getting robbed downstairs. At first, Biggie thought that C's was joking and trying to prank him, but then he understood that he's being serious and he immediately rushed to the elevator with his gun, going down, while the other elevator was going up. This one was used by Park, Stretch and Zayt who were going up to the 8th floor where Puffy, Jimmy Henchman, Andre Harrell and Little Sean were waiting. Again, Andre Harrell was Puffy's mentor, and Little Sean was the guy Tupac was supposed to record with. Puck thought Biggie was on that floor as well, but he was actually in the elevator going down to the first floor. When Biggie and Chico arrived at the lobby, they saw Tupac's bandana on the ground and blood everywhere. The cops came and pulled them to the side to question them. Little C's and the rest of the Junior Mafia clique later went down as well and were questioned by the police. They all knew nothing. So Park comes out the elevator with Stretch and his brother-in-law Zaytz, and they run into Puffy, Jimmy Henchman, Andre Harrell, Little Sean and others. Zaytz supposedly held Puffy at gunpoint. They were already treating them like the enemy. A lot of things were going through Park's head while he was upstairs on the 8th floor. There were supposedly around 40 people there. He was confused, upset and suspicious. Maybe the men in the studio knew who'd done it and weren't saying anything. One of the reasons why he went upstairs was to see their reactions, see who's shocked and genuinely worried about him. He leaned against the glass doors on the 8th floor and looked at everyone while bleeding from a set. Everyone looked surprised when they saw him, including Puffy and Jimmy Henchman. According to Park, little Sean immediately started crying and helped him to sit down. He and Stretch supported him from both sides and helped him walk to the couch, but Park refused to sit down. They all saw the blood on his head and pants. Park was in quote-unquote movie mode and started accusing people, saying that only Jimmy Henchman knew that he was coming, that nobody approached him and that everyone was looking suspicious. He would yell, it was a setup, call the police, what the hell is going on? He was confused, disoriented and full of anger. Blood came gushing out of his head and groin area, and it was hard for people to calm him down. He was moving around so much that the wounds were opening. According to Park, no one tried to help him, but pretty much everyone else said that they were worried, and tried to do everything they can to help him. They called the police, Park's mother and an ambulance. The EMS team then came and treated Tupac while he was on the ground. They removed his clothes, secured a brace around his neck and strapped him to a board. Zayd and little Sean went to the other room to hide Tupac's gun, the one he used to shoot at the assailants. They hid it inside a piano to make sure that Park doesn't get in legal trouble again, cause the cops came and questioned everybody. They locked down the entire building. This was just a small summary of the events that transpired that day. More about this in the Quad Studio documentary. So now Park gets carried down the elevator and according to Chico Del Vec, he and Biggie see him when he gets carried out of the building into the ambulance. Park had seen Chico on the balcony with little C's, so before the shooting happened they gave him a feel of safety, but now he's laying in front of them, fully naked, covered in blood, confused and disoriented, looking angry and accusing everybody. When he got past Biggie, Chico and the rest of Junior Mafia, he put up a middle finger and pointed at them, basically saying F you to Biggie and his crew. But while they rolling him off the elevator, he looking at us against the wall and he's like, he's saying F you niggas. And Big was like, yo, why does it do mad at us about something about what the, f yeah. we ain't do nothing wrong, you know what I'm saying? And then he looking around at us, looking, so what, what kind of expression he expect on our face? What are we supposed to, we don't, we don't know what's going on, we looking like, oh, Chico and Biggie figured Park was confused. After all, he'd just been bomb rushed and nearly killed. But they couldn't believe that he'd blame them for the shooting. That's how they interpreted Park putting up his middle finger. And in fairness to Chico and Biggie, there's very little evidence that they were indeed involved. Chico denied that Biggie and Junior Mafia had any connection to the shooting. 
said Biggie came downstairs with a gun with the intention to defend Park, ready to get into a shooting for Sonomy. Before Park left the scene, he was interviewed by newspaper reporters while still being on the stretcher. He only said it was a setup, right before they carried him into the ambulance. They took a photo of him lying naked on the stretcher. The ambulance then drove off and rushed to the hospital. Videotape shot from outside the studio by a TV camera operator showed Puffy inside the downstairs lobby, in a baseball cap with a straw hanging from his mouth, staring at the camera and talking to several men. News footage also showed Biggie walking out the lobby, closely followed by Puffy. A lot of people were in and out the studio that night, many of whom were as bejeweled with gold as Park was, but they weren't robbed or shot. That's how Tupac knew that the robbery was a calculated and planned setup. He was sure that no one else would have gotten robbed in his place, even if they had more jewelry on them than him. And indeed, he got confirmation by Jimmy Henchman himself that they were responsible for it. Cause when Puck was laying in the hospital beds, he was receiving death threats over the phone. His closest homies were relaying messages from his enemies. Stretch's brother Majesty confirmed that Jimmy Henchman was sending threats and messages moments after the shooting. They got the phone number of Stretch's mother and called the crib to relay a message. We don't want beef, but we got money for war though. Stretch then went to visit Tupac in the hospital to pass the message. Napoleon from the Outlaws was there too. And according to him, Stretch told Puck, Jimmy Henchman told me that you don't got your money right. You don't want to go to war. Puck was still laying in a hospital bed when he heard this. He and Napoleon thought it was weird for him to relay messages from his enemies. It almost seemed like he was cool with Jimmy Henchman. Stretch also asked Puck why he fought back. Somebody had told him that they were just going to take his jewelry and that it was Puck's fault for getting shot. So Puck was wondering where Stretch got all the information from. They thought maybe Stretch is sending messages to Jimmy Henchman as well informing him about where he's at, in what condition he is, what he's planning, what his next move is, if he really wants to go to war with him, and if he's holding a grudge. Park just couldn't trust him anymore. He felt betrayed and at the same time unsafe, thinking that Stretch might tell Jimmy his exact location, so that he can send his people to come finish the job. Park's friends and family were there with him at the hospital to protect him, just like the Nation of Islam. They kept an eye out for everyone that came to visit him, thinking they might try to kill him while he's laying there defenseless. The notorious B.I.G. actually came to the hospital to pay him a visit, but they didn't let him see him. Park didn't want to see his face, thinking that he might be involved in the setup, cause hours after the shooting, Park already got told who those men were that came to rob him. He knew that those were people from Brooklyn, where Biggie and his homies are from. Everywhere Park went during the Quad Studio incident, he met Biggie's people. Little C's and Chico on the balcony, then Puffy and his mentor Andre Harrell, Little Sean and Jimmy Henchman with whom Big would also work together after the robbery, and the entire Junior Mafia clique when they carried him to the ambulance. And as mentioned earlier, he thought that those robbers were Biggie's security. And on top of all that, Biggie tried to tell him something about Haitian Jack and his people, days before the shooting. So all this made him suspect Biggie. He talked about this in the Sway interview in 96. And he told me like, about a week before I got shot, he knew that it was shot me. He was like, Pop, don't hang around this thing. You know, I walked in with the that shot and they ended up shooting me. He's like, Pop, don't this, because I knew it too, because my Kogi thing. And uh, I was like, what you mean? He's like, I'll talk to you about it later. And we didn't talk. And the next time I saw him was at the studio where I got shot. So I knew he knew what happened. Mm -hmm. So I was like, Biggie, what happened? He kept sending me messages like, a, you know, like, I'm gonna come see you. No. What happened? Seeing Biggie's homie Little C's on the balcony who told him to go around the building was also a terrible coincidence, as Park wouldn't have even thought about Biggie if C's wasn't there. And it most likely contributed to him losing trust in them, since he lowered his guard the moment he saw Biggie's homies, and then jumped to conclusions thinking that the robbers are Biggie's security, right when he went inside the building. Had he not seen C's on the balcony, he wouldn't have thought that those men in army fatigues were Biggie's homies. That's why Park told everyone to not let Biggie come to see him in the hospital. He was paranoid. Puffy, of course, didn't care about paying him a visit. But Big did, cause he was a homie. 
That's why he and Park's brother-in-law Zaid went to the quad studios the day after the shooting to get the gun from the piano. So that Tupac doesn't get in trouble. They don't just let anybody inside that building. You need to get buzzed in by someone inside the quad studios to get inside. No one would have buzzed in Zaid on his own. But Biggie was a well-known artist, so they let him in. Without Biggie, Zaid wouldn't have been able to get that gun which means that somebody would have eventually found it and handed it over to the police. With Park's fingerprints on the gun, he would have been in trouble, cause they actually found the bullet in the lobby. So Big did him a favor during a time when Park didn't want to speak to him. A day later on December 1st, Park checked himself out of the hospital and made a surprise appearance in the Manhattan courtroom, where his fate was being decided in the Ayanna Jackson assault case. Park sat through the morning session before his right leg went numb, that's when he decided to leave the courtroom. He then went uptown and secretly checked into the Metropolitan Hospital Center on East 97th Street. A day later, he was already discharged. He had received even more death threats on the phone. And his family wanted to move him somewhere where he's safe. So he holed up at the apartment of a friend, the actress Jasmine Guy, who Park met when he guest starred on a sitcom A Different World. He spent the next few weeks in her apartment, being cared for by his mother Athene and a private doctor. He also got protection from a group of people who later became the outlaws. The ones who stayed in the apartment with Park were Napoleon, Castro, Idi Amin and Gaddafi. Those became his closest soldiers from that point on. His closest companions. He deaded the thug life movement as he didn't know who to trust. Cutting ties with everyone including Stretch and Biggie. Most of the outlaws at the time were Tupac's family. They all had guns on them, ready to protect Park with their lives, in case Jimmy Henchman or Haitian Jack's people found them to finish the job. Jasmine Guy lived in a secure and safe neighborhood, which made Park feel more comfortable to an extent, but he was still holding on to his gun the whole time he was there, paranoid, thinking they might come any time. But fortunately, nobody came and Park could make a full recovery. Big and Park were not on speaking terms anymore. But they kept sending each other messages. Park asked him what happened and Big wouldn't tell him. Biggie sent him messages requesting to meet up with him and talk in person. But Park wanted answers first. He was convinced that Biggie was hiding something, cause he had all his people around him in that building. They were everywhere on multiple floors. People on the east coast believed that Tupac was acting this way because of pure immaturity, seeing him as someone who can't admit that he's wrong cause he wanted to be the one that's cool with all the gangsters and street cats, the rapper that knows the streets the best, the one with wisdom and intelligence, someone that's a mentor to everybody. He wanted Biggie to see him as his mentor and big brother, someone who he looks up to and reaches out to to get advice and help. Park wanted to be seen as the teacher, the mentor, the big brother, the guy that's always right, the guy that made it, the guy that everyone reaches out to to learn. With Biggie saying stay away from Haitian Jack and with Park ignoring his advice and then getting into trouble, it was a I told you so moment. The people on the east coast think that Tupac felt ashamed and didn't have the courage to walk up to Biggie and tell him I should have listened to you. With Biggie saying I told you so, you should have listened to me. It made Biggie look like the guy with the wisdom, the guy who knows the streets better than Park. And Park, according to the critics on the East Coast, was too embarrassed to admit that he was wrong. It kinda destroyed the image he had built for himself, cause Park was always the one giving advices to Biggie. But now it was Biggie who was on top, telling Park how to move in these streets, what to do and what not to do. And Biggie was right. This supposedly upset Tupac. His ego and pride was out of this world. He was incapable of humbling himself in front of one of his own soldiers didn't want to hear him say, I told you so, you should have listened to me. Cause Biggie wasn't just a soldier anymore, he was a general now with his own soldiers. And Park didn't want to get treated like one of his soldiers. Biggie became a huge rap star in the game. 1994 was his year. Earlier all lies were on Park. Everyone idolized him. But now he was going through his worst moments. Being rolled around in a wheelchair with bullet holes all over his body needing weeks of rest to get fully healed while getting ready to go to prison for a crime he didn't commit. With the media destroying his image and everything he has worked for. Hip hop heads on the east coast were convinced that in order to not lose face in front of everyone, Park chose to go on the offensive. 
partially blaming or at least distancing himself from Biggie and Puffy, instead of meeting up with them and telling Biggie that he was right. That's how Park's haters on the East Coast felt at the time. Keeping his distance from Biggie made him question everything about the Quad Studio incident. When he got wheeled out the building while he was on the gurney, neither Biggie nor any of the Junior Mafia members looked at him with worry. Park interpreted that as them having zero empathy or feelings for him, as if they knew he was about to get dealt with. Same with Puffy, Andre Harrell, Little Sean, Jimmy Henchman and everyone else in that building. It's possible that Park made everything worse in his head than it actually transpired, after having enough time at home to digest what happened. Just him over and over recalling everything from memory, and subconsciously making everything worse in his head, by overanalyzing the smallest details. Cause he was filled with adrenaline and anger, and he obviously perceived the things differently than everyone else that was present that day. His memory and perception might have been clouded by anger. The people on the East Coast believed that Park blaming them for not showing enough empathy was because he wanted to act tough and distract from the fact that he got roughed up, humbled and robbed. Which people on the streets think is dishonorable. In the hood, you don't want to be known as the guy that got punked and robbed. Status and image is very important. People don't want to look weak like a victim. They want to look tough and strong. Especially when they have a reputation and are known for their gangster and thug image. And Parks supposedly didn't want people to think that he's a fake gangster and actor. Someone who shot himself in the attempt of defending himself from the robbers. So that's why he supposedly chose to run with the whole story of everybody in that building setting him up. Or at least knowing about the plans of that robbery. That's how Parks enemies on the east coast interpreted his behavior. Saying that he made the whole thing bigger than it is. Turning it into a conspiracy to save his image. Instead of being known as the fake gangster who shot himself when he got tested, he wanted to be known as this heroic figure that got set up by a whole coast. And Park didn't want to have anything to do with them anymore. He was done with the East Coast. On December 24th, they then released the single Big Papa, which became one of Biggie's biggest hits. It's helped to boost the sales of Ready to Die. Park got a little mad that Biggie's Ready to Die was outselling Thug Life. It turned out that Biggie turning his back on the group and focusing on his own career was a wise move, since Thug Life was commercially a flop. He was also upset that Big Papa, the song they copied from him, became such a huge hit. It was a missed opportunity for him. Cause like explained earlier, Puff Daddy got his hands on Park's song Time To Get My Drink On, which was originally supposed to be on Park's third album. But Puffy stole it and reproduced the beat using the same sample telling Biggie to rap on it. They wanted to put it out before Puck. Now he was profiting from Puck's ideas, using them before him. With those same ideas Puck would scrap, Biggie would go multi-platinum, while Puck is forced to start from scratch and reinvent himself. It seemed like Big and Puck were already competing during the recording process of Ready to Die and Me Against the World. And now after the shooting, Puck would slowly start to let out all the frustrations he had with Biggie all the grudges and anger he had built up. But back then the only way of publicly spreading a message and reaching the masses was through interviews and songs, for which he had no time as he was in the middle of the healing process and also had to deal with the Ayanna Jackson assault case, which was in its final stages now. While Park maintained his innocence, his financial resources were being stretched to the limit by the legal action and he couldn't make bail. While his lawyer worked on his appeal, Park was locked up on February 14, 1995 in the correctional facility in New York. It was during the time that Biggie exploded on the rap scene. Exactly one week after Park got locked up, Biggie and Puffy decided to release a song called Who Shot Ya? February 21st, 1995, three months after the Quad Studio shooting. The title itself made everybody raise an eyebrow. But the overall concept and sound of the records made it even worse. Jimmy Henchman and Puffy wanted to put out that record to aggravate the wound and create controversy around the time Tupac was in the news every day, because of not only the shooting but also him going to prison for a crime he didn't commit. He was a trending topic in the news and the main topic in the hip hop world. So hearing who shot ya with the Tupac shooting in the news, people put two and two together and came to the conclusion that Biggie is dissing Pac. The timing was just terrible. 
but it was done purposefully and strategically to increase Biggie's record sales, using the attention Puck gets from the media for Biggie's music. So they were basically making profit off another man's moment of pain, even though that same man opened doors for them and was one of their closest homies. The whole game interpreted the song as a taunt at Puck. There were rumors going around at that time that he didn't actually get shot five times, but that he only shot himself and that he lied to the public to save his reputation. Biggie heard the rumor and got confirmation from Stretch, who was actually there. He said he only heard one shot. So the answer to Biggie asking the question, who shot ya, would have been Tupac. Tupac shot himself. So that of course infuriated Pac even more. People in Biggie's camp knew that it would create controversy. And Puffy was rubbing his hands like the devil, knowing that he can make profit from it. Trolling a man who's been the biggest topic on the news and can't defend himself now that he's in prison. All while remaining close to Jimmy Henchman, the mastermind behind the shooting. Park wouldn't have been able to lyrically respond for about half a decade even if he wanted to, cause he was sentenced to one and a half to four and a half years in prison. If Suge Knight hadn't bailed him out eight months later, we might have not gotten a response. When Park heard the song in prison, he was super upset and thought that they did it on purpose as a slick way to laugh at him. He was hurt, not only because Big is his homie and it's a sensitive topic, but also because he thought the song is dope. That's what he told people. If Who Shot Ya was a trash song, it wouldn't have bothered him. But the song became the hardest thing in hip hop. It really pissed him off. Such a great track. But it sounded like it was aimed at him. Normally he would have been happy for Biggie for dropping such a great track. But this was the first Biggie song he couldn't bump like everyone else. Everyone in prison was playing it. They had it on repeat, telling Park that Biggie is taunting him. And Park had to endure it for the next eight months. He couldn't escape it. I mean, he goes to prison and a week later they drop the song. Prison mates would always ask him if there's beef between them. All while Park was in a state of confusion, isolated from the rest of the world, with no contact to any of the people involved. He couldn't just call Biggie and talk it out with him, but he would hear all types of rumors while he was locked up. And for the next couple of weeks, he would always hear Biggie say, who shot ya? When family members would come to visit him, he would ask them, why would he release that song? What is he trying to do? Because Park never heard it before. Biggie used to give him demo tapes of songs that were just about to drop, to show him what he was currently working on. On the surface, this one seemed like a brand new record recorded after the shooting. Especially with Puffy yelling 95, short for 1995. Even though the first verse, more specifically the first version of the first verse, was recorded in 94, three months before the Quad Studio shooting. This was the first recording of the song Who Shot Ya, with only one biggie verse. The second one wasn't planned at first. Puffy was yelling 95 in the ad-libs of the song. Those vocals were recorded in Summer 94. If you listen closely, you can hear that the verse is slightly altered from the final version. It's an entirely different take. He actually called himself Biggie Smalls on this. But in the final version, which was recorded months later, he said B.I.G. So two completely different recordings. He had to change it because the artist Biggie Smalls threatened to sue him if he continues to call himself Biggie Smalls. So in summer 94, he officially changed his name to the notorious B.I.G. This was shortly before his album Ready to Die came out, meaning before September 94. But this meant that they couldn't use the first version of Who Shot Ya? The beat was initially intended for Mary J. Blige's album My Life. Biggie and Keith Murray had a verse on it. But Puffy ended up giving the beat to Biggie. Keith Murray's verse was then later used on Eric Sermon's song Tell Him, and then also on the K. Murray interlude on Mary's album. The second take of Biggie's first verse was recorded after the release of Ready to Die, somewhere around the time Tupac got shot, and nobody wants to reveal when exactly the song was re-recorded. Again, only the first take of the first verse was recorded before the Quad Studio shooting. The second take of the first verse and the second verse which completed the song were recorded after the shooting. Because according to DJ Clark Kent, Biggie was fed up with Clark overpraising the rapper Jay-Z, 
when they were on tour together in December 94, meaning the month after Tupac got shot. The song wouldn't have been re-recorded and completed if DJ Clark Kent hadn't annoyed Biggie, cause Biggie didn't know what to do with that song. Who Shot Ya became a track for Biggie to show off his rapping skills, a way for Biggie to prove that he's a better rapper than Jay-Z. So while being on tour, Biggie went back to the studio in New York to record the second verse of Who Shot Ya and also to re-record the first verse to improve his delivery, while also changing a couple of lines like the one where he calls himself Biggie Smalls, and also the one in the outro where he's giving Mary J. Blige a shoutout. Two days later they went back on tour, and Biggie played DJ Clark Kent the final version of the song Who Shot Ya, to convince him that he's a better rapper than Jay-Z. This whole incident happened when Biggie, Junior Mafia and DJ Clark Kent were touring, which they did in December 94, and Biggie played him the song at the airport. So again, the second verse with the lines against Jay-Z and possibly against Tupac were recorded a couple weeks after the Quad Studio shooting, which happened on November 30th. There's footage of DJ Clark Kent and Biggie performing together in Richmond, Virginia on December 27th. They were flying from city to city and playing each other music. Clark Kent made Biggie listen to Jay's songs and Biggie made him listen to his own songs. Even if Who Shot Ya wasn't a diss at Tupac, it was strategically released at a very vulnerable moment for him, knowing that the media would hype it up and turn it into a headline. Park was already getting crucified by the media, and people were calling him names for the assault case, destroying his image and reputation, to the point that the people from Interscope Records didn't really want him to have him on their label anymore, even though he became a platinum artist. At this point, Park was really done with rap, cause the media had destroyed everything he worked for, to the point that people started to view him as this disgusting filthy animal and psycho, the complete opposite of what he was trying to be. Plus he's in prison, locked up for a couple of years, and now Puff and Big are kicking him while he's already on the ground defeated. And the people who really believe that Puck is an abuser really love the idea that he's getting dissed. Look, we're dissing this disgusting animal that just got locked up for assaulting a woman. They never actually said it, but that's how some people interpreted this song. Biggie didn't even think that Puck would take offense to it, nor did he care about it. Again, he probably had zero intention to diss him. Let's take him by his words, cause he always denied it. That being said, pretty much everyone at the time thought that it was about Tupac. I mean, who else in the rap game got shot around that time? Why drop a single called Who Shot Ya when your homie gets shot and thinks that you might have known something about it? You wouldn't do that to a friend, it's distasteful. People connected the dots and said that him releasing the song exactly a week after Park went to prison couldn't have been a coincidence. You would expect your friend to proceed with caution after you accused him of knowing something about the setup, cause Park was already claiming that Puffy and Andre Harrell knew about it, as they were there with Jimmy Henchman when Park came up the elevator covered in blood, with Jimmy using Stretch to send him messages he had confirmation that it was indeed him who gave the green light for the shooting. Why would Biggie and Puffy continue to do business with Jimmy after the shooting and those threats? This is where Park slowly started to become paranoid and started to overanalyze every line from rappers from New York, thinking that it might be a subliminal line against him. He really started thinking that it was him against the world, with every rapper from New York trying to say something slick about him in their lyrics. And it all started with Who Shot Ya. Park interpreted some of the lines on there as references to the Quad Studio shooting. Who shot ya? The leap from the ops, leap hard to creep the Brooklyn streets. The opening lines already hit a nerve with Park thinking that Biggie is directly talking to him, asking who shot ya. Knowing that his best friend Big Stretch, who was there that night sitting on the ground during the robbery, has witnessed the whole incident and told Biggie that Tupac shot himself and that no other bullets were fired. Biggie was convinced that Park made up the whole story about getting shot five times to make it more dramatic, and Park thought that Biggie asking who shot ya was sarcastic, an attempt to belittle him, calling him weak and obsolete. Weak because he couldn't defend himself with a gun in his hand, and obsolete because Biggie is now taking his spot in the rap game with Park going to prison for one and a half to four and a half years. 
Again, these lines are not about Tupac. The entire first verse was written in summer 94. But Park interpreted these lines differently and thought it was a diss. Like him saying, hard to creep them Brooklyn streets. The robbers came from Brooklyn and they all looked like Biggie's homies. It's all nothing, I'm going that bigger and beef. I can hear sweat trickling down your cheek. So Biggie is telling the guy who got shot that the beef is on. Hearing your friends say this after going through a traumatizing experience like this must have been soul crushing for him. With rumors of Puffy and Biggie's involvement in the shooting floating around, on top of Puck accusing people of setting him up and Biggie saying it's on F all that bickering beef, Puck saw it as confirmation that Biggie really has a problem with him and wants to beef with him. He started to connect the dots with the possibility of Biggie's homie Little C's quote unquote luring him into a trap by telling him to come around the corner to the place where the robbers were waiting for him. Assuming that Little C's and thus Biggie might have been involved in this or at least might have known about this, it wouldn't make sense for Biggie to be so insensitive and drop a song like this the week Park went to prison if he really wasn't involved. That's what Park thought. This line is often mistaken as a reference to the court studio shooting, where the neighbors called the cops after hearing the shots. Biggie was in the lobby getting interviewed by the police when they carried Park out the building. But the lines that people use to back up the theory that the song was indeed aimed at Park are the following. Old school, new school, need to learn though. Tupac had a song called Old School on the album Me Against the World, which was just about to drop. He played it for Biggie when the two hung out together. So people thought that Biggie is referencing that song. But again, that verse was recorded three months before the Quad Studio shooting, with LL Cool J sitting in the studio writing lyrics. And the target for that line wasn't Park, but L cause Biggie, for whatever reason, didn't like him and actually dissed LL on the song when he said Old school, new school, need to learn though. L and Biggie were competing for the crown back then. Not only did they go toe to toe on the Flavor In Your Ear remix, but they both wanted the King of New York title for themselves, with L representing the older generation and Big the new one. That's why he said old school, new school, need to learn though. Biggie would later record a song called Going Back to Kelly, similar to LL's song, which has the same title. Part of the reason why he did it was because he wanted to show L that his song is better, while L's song sounds dated, indirectly telling him that he's old and obsolete. Just like he said in the beginning of Who Shot Ya, Biggie wanted to take his spot. LL Cool J is not only considered the leader of the first new school era in hip hop, but at this point in his career, with him being a veteran MC that has been in the game for over 10 years, people started to put him in the old school category. And Biggie wanted to show LL that he's obsolete, that he's a thing of the past now, that he should just sit back and learn from him, as big as the rightful owner of the crown, the King of New York title. So they were competing. Both L and Big prepared verses for the Who Shot Ya beat, but Big was faster. L was still sitting in the studio writing when you heard Big E dissing him. Everyone in the studio knew that it was about L, who then later recorded the response record called I Shot Ya, which Park also took offense to when it came out on October 31st, 1995. So in 95, we got two game-changing records about shooting someone, with everyone thinking that both songs were aimed at Park, both Who Shot Ya and I Shot Ya. All because of Biggie and Puffy. Who shot you? I shot you. I shot you. They unintentionally caused the beef between Park and L, and also the feature guests on the song, cause the remix to I Shot Ya was a posse track with some of the illest rappers from New York at the time, and Park thought that everyone from New York was out to get him. First Biggie, then L, and then a whole entourage of rappers. Park later confronted one of the future guests of I Shot Ya, called Keith Murray, who, like I said earlier, was not only on the original and remix version of LL's I Shot Ya, but also on the first version of Biggie's Who Shot Ya. There was also friction with the other feature guests, 
Fat Joe, Prodigy from Mob Deep and Foxy Brown. Pac was under the impression that all these rappers were trying to beef with him. Cause around that same time, Fat Joe had made some comments about him on the radio. Saying that he's ready to beef with him if Pac makes a step in his direction. Cause Pac was wilding out in interviews and blaming all the major A&Rs, label managers, rappers and DJs in New York of knowing who set him up. Fat Joe felt some type of way about it and warned him on the radio. Pac was then approached and threatened by all the Puerto Ricans in prison. They put him on a phone with Joe and they talked it out. Fat Joe's people then had Pac's back. Cause Pac actually had love and respect for Joe prior to the shooting. They made peace before I Shot Ya dropped. And once I Shot Ya came out, Pac started to see him as his enemy. Fat Joe would also stay loyal to Biggie. And they would later even record diss records against Pac. Pac also got into a beef with Prodigy from Up Deep after being released from prison. And Foxy Brown would not only become a member of the rival rap group The Firm with AZ and Nas, with whom Park would beef with in 96, but she was also present the day Tupac got shot in Las Vegas on September 7th, 1996. She was in the Black Bands with a man named Eric Von Zipp, who gave the Crip Kifi D the gun which they used to shoot Tupac. I covered this in my Tupac murder documentary, make sure to check it out. So yeah. Who shot ya caused a lot of problems for Park. All of a sudden, he was beefing with all the major rappers from the East Coast. Them being on the song I Shot Ya contributed to Tupac having an issue with New York, cause he felt like they were all making fun of him for getting robbed and shot after coming to New York, while using his moment of pain to get some clout. Rapping I Shot Ya when the whole world is wondering who shot Tupac. Anyway, in my video for the Big and Nas Beef, I also explained how the second verse on Who Shot Ya was dedicated to Jay. Make sure to check it out for more info. So yeah, the main targets of the song were LL Cool J and Jay-Z, not Tupac. It was also a warning to his adversaries to not mess with him, cause he's not actually dropping names. This could technically be about anyone, but a lot of the lines were interpreted as jabs at Tupac. Like when he said, I make your skin chase, rashes on the masses, bumps and bruises, bloods and land cruises. Pac got pistol whipped and bruised up, which left him bleeding. He had chafed skin on the side of his head. And Biggie is saying that the victim he's about to shoot will get his skin chafed. But these lines couldn't have been about the quad studio shooting since they're from the first verse, which again was written before Pac got shot. But people still thought that he's talking about Pac. And he of course re-recorded the verse after the shooting, knowing that Park went through the exact same things he's rapping about. But things got more interesting in the second verse, which was written after the shooting. These are the lines that you could argue were meant for Park, even though Big didn't really have a reason to diss him, aside from the fact that he got robbed by Haitian Jack's people because of Tupac supposedly running his mouth. Some people think that that was Biggie's motivation for dissing him, cause he spit lines like. When Park reached for his gun, two of the three robbers supposedly shot him. He made a false move when they were frisking him. When Park reached for his gun and turned around, the robbers quickly reacted and Park got riddled with bullets. That's the meaning of getting Swiss cheesed up. Getting holes from all directions. Rolex on the arm. The robbers took all of Park's jewelry, except for the Rolex Haitian Jack bought him. They left the Rolex watch on Park's arm to send him a message and to make him understand that they only roughed him up because he messed with Haitian Jack and Jimmy Henchman. Park was also the one who bought Biggie his first Rolex. So yeah, a lot of weird coincidences. There are too many lines on here that sound like jabs at Park. Like when he said, Recognize my face, so there won't be no mistake. So you know where to tell Jake Lane one. Jake is a slang term for cops, the police. Tupac was calling the cops shortly before going upstairs. And he later told Puffy, Andre Harrell and everyone in the building to go get the cops. Pacing around the room saying, call the cops. It was a setup. Puffy and everyone else were surprised to hear Tupac, the cop shooter, ask for the cops since he always had this image of him being basically the enemy of the police and the government, never wanting to cooperate with them, 
especially after shooting two off-duty police officers, witnessing police brutality firsthand, and after getting arrested numerous times. And him saying, recognize my face so there won't be no mistake, almost sounds like a response to Park blindly accusing everybody of setting him up, even though he didn't know for sure who was involved. And yeah, he also wanted those same people to call the cops. These lines were also interpreted as a reference to Park making front page after getting shot five times at the Quad Studios. Everybody called him brave and bold for reaching for his gun when he was being held at gunpoint. All they wanted was his jewelry. They didn't even want to shoot him. While Park's homies dropped to the floor, he was brave and stood his ground tried to fight back even though he was outnumbered and being held at gunpoint. So even the part where Biggie called his victim brave fits Park's situation at the Quad Studios perfectly. Almost every line in the second verse can somehow be linked to the shooting. The title Who Shot Ya combined with him saying the victim turned front page after getting shot left no doubt in Park's mind that Biggie was talking slick about him. And Park wasn't the only one feeling that way. In 95, Biggie would start performing the song live, like in Chicago for example. And the crowd oftentimes would get upset, thinking that he's dissing Park. So Biggie didn't really perform it as much as some of his other hits. This industry, I turn your best friends into your worst enemies. Park warned me, but I didn't believe him. This song was made months ago. He probably won't believe me. Maybe nobody will. But frankly, I don't give a f oh, so yeah, this is one of those songs that people consider a diss track even though it's supposedly not. The bad boy camp has always denied it. But with Park becoming paranoid and overanalyzing every lyric, he took offense to all the lines I highlighted. And he also agreed with the media and fans that the song is about him. In prison, people who didn't like him would bump the song so loud that Puck would hear it. And he was constantly reminded of the shooting. Strangers would approach and ask him if he heard the rumors of Biggie having something to do with it. Some claimed that Biggie admitted to it right in front of them. With Big and Puff laughing at him, saying that they finally got rid of him. While well, I'm in jail, strangers is telling me. Yo, you don't know? Biggie homeboy shot you. Cause they bragging, they telling they niggas in jail. Yo, we just got popped. Ooh, ooh. And my cousin was in jail in New York because I got family out there. He sit right there while the niggas get the call for Yo, my homeboys just jacked that two pop. So that's how I knew he shot me. What happened next? This was Park's biggest fear. He had been thinking of the possibility of Big having something to do with it. He was confused and didn't know who to trust. Now, the people who approached him in prison and told him those rumors could have lied about it or made it up, just to create a conflict. Cause people love drama and fights, even if they're pointless. It's entertainment to them, especially when celebrities are involved. Park was in such a vulnerable state that you could have told him anything and he would have believed it. He wanted to make sure to not make the same mistakes again and trust the wrong people. Cause up until this point, he thought that no black man can do him wrong, as he was always fighting for their rights with him being the son of a Black Panther. But that incident destroyed everything he believed in. He felt like he was stabbed in the back by his own people. Not only because of the shooting, but also because of the Ayanna Jackson assault case. And he had been fighting for women's rights his entire career, spreading awareness with songs like Keep Your Head Up, for example. It definitely destroyed everything he believed in. That's why when he came out of prison, he became a completely different person. He understood that you can't trust anybody, but he definitely took everything the prison mate said to heart and didn't think of the possibility that those rumors were made up, as he would hear multiple people repeating the same thing, and they would confirm some of his biggest fears and theories. Park told Vibe, even if the song ain't about me, you should be like, I'm not putting it out, cause he might think it's about him. Biggie responded to those comments in the September 96 issue of the Vibe magazine, saying, I wrote that mother effing song way before Tupac got shot. It was supposed to be the intro to that ish Keith Murray was doing on Mary J. Blige's joint. But Puff said it was too hard. 
Biggie is talking about the K. Murray interlude on Mary J. Blood's 94 album My Life. Big is trickle-truthing the audience here. Cause like explained earlier, the version with Keith Murray only had the first verse. Actually, the first version of the first verse. Which later got changed. But that's the only verse he wrote before the shooting. The second one, together with the updated first verse, was written in December 94, meaning after Puck got shot. On March 14th, Tupac's third album Me Against the World finally came out, but the Biggie and Stretch features were removed. Stretch was supposed to be on the single So Many Tears, but he was cut off the album. Same with Big. The song Running From The Police, which also had Stretch on it, was removed from the tracklist either due to their beef or because it was deemed by Interscope Records to be too controversial to be released. But it's true that Park didn't want them on his album anymore. Not only that, but the whole Thug Life movement was dead to him. Nobody ever came to save me. They just watch what happened to you. That's why Thug Life to me is dead. If it's real, then let somebody else represent it. Because I'm tired of it. I represented it too much. I was Thug Life. I was the only guy out there putting my life on the line. This Thug Life stuff was… it was just ignorance. My intentions was always in the right place. I never killed anybody. I never R-worded anybody. I never committed no crimes that weren't honorable, that weren't to defend myself. That's what he said in the April 95 issue of the Vibe magazine, where he addressed the Quad Studio incident and the aftermath. He gave us his views on who was behind the shooting and told us exactly what happened that night. The cover story was titled Ready to Live, which people saw as a subliminal jab at Biggie, whose debut album is titled Ready to Die. The magazines back then did it on purpose to start drama, like a year later in the July 96 issue of The Source magazine for example, where they called the cover story for Dr. Dre Life After Death, the same name as Biggie's second album. Both Dre and Biggie made peace at the time, and they were both beefing with Tupac, who of course took offense to it. Just like how Biggie took offense to the cover story Ready to Live, with Park going off on everybody that was there during the Quad Studio shooting. Cause in this interview, Park wrongly accused Biggie of being there on the 8th floor together with Puffy and Jimmy Henchman, the guy who plotted the shooting. But Big wasn't there. It was completely untrue. He was on the 10th floor. He didn't see Park until he came out the building on a gurney. And Biggie was forced to correct him in interviews. Cause people started blaming him even though he wasn't even there for Park. The main people who were waiting for Park were Jimmy Henchman, Andre Harrell and Little Sean. Puffy was just there by coincidence. But Jimmy told him that Park was about to get dealt with. Biggie, Little C's and Junior Mafia were two floors above them. And Puff was trying to find them. In the Vibe magazine, Park described what happened when he got to the 8th floor. When we got upstairs, I looked around and it scared the ish out of me. Why? the interviewer asked. Because Andre Harrell was there. Puffy was there. Biggie. There was about 40 people there. The only people Tupac expected to see were Jimmy Henchman and Little Sean. He didn't expect to see anyone else there. Park also expressed his disappointment in his best friend Big Stretch for allowing the robbers to beat him up and shoot him. All while he was just sitting there doing nothing. He felt like he didn't get enough support, empathy and help. Nobody approached me. I noticed that nobody would look at me. Andre Harrell wouldn't look at me. Puffy was standing back too. I knew Puffy. He knew how much stuff I had done for Biggie before he came out. In the interview, he didn't really say that Biggie and Puffy set him up, or that they knew something about the shooting. But that's how people interpreted this interview, especially with him calling them out by names, and saying that Biggie was there when he wasn't. He also said that the shooters looked like some of Biggie's homies, and that nobody showed empathy. Biggie was actually mad at Park for throwing Stretch under the bus. This article actually made Big and Stretch become way closer. Cause Park called Stretch a coward for not helping, for dropping like a sack of potatoes even though he was the biggest guy there. And Biggie felt like he shouldn't have said that. In the MTV interview on March 30th, he responded to that article and expressed his disappointment in Park. 
The Tupac article had me pissed off, you know what I'm saying? Because first of all, he dissed my man, said my man turned his back on him, and I know for a fact that didn't happen, you know what I'm saying? My closest friends did me in. My mm -hmm. closest friends, my homies, people who I done took care of their whole family. I done took care of everything for them, looked out for them, put them in the game, everything turned on me. And the rumors that's spreading is on some tip like we set them up. You know what I'm saying? And that's crazy. It's just ridiculous, you know what I'm saying? But then I also understand that if you was to get shot five times, the mind is just completely spinning, you know what I'm saying? You're real confused about your situation. So it'll cause you to say things that you really don't mean. I would tell each and every person out there, don't forget about that clicking up thing, you know what I mean? Be to yourself. Stay to yourself. Trust nobody. Trust nobody. After reading the Vibe interview, Lil Sean and Big talked about that night at the Quad Studios. Big told him that he's sad and disappointed in Park for thinking that he had something to do with the robbery. He said that he warned him about the people who robbed him before the robbery happened, told him to stay away from them. He also accused Park of telling Haitian Jack and his people that he warned him. And that's supposedly why Haitian Jack and his people came after Biggie as well, and they robbed him too. Cause Biggie was told by the people who robbed him that Park notified Jack about him warning Park. That's how Big knew that it was Haitian Jack's people who came after him. So Big was mad that Park put him on blast. He told Sean that Tim and Zayt went to the Quad Studios the morning after the shooting to get the gun and the piano. He also told him that they went to the hospital to see Park but they wouldn't let him in. All his attempts of reaching Park were denied. And now Park is supposedly spreading lies in the media and turning this whole thing into a beef. While Park's Thug Life movement came to an end, Biggie's junior mafia clique was just about to take over the game. They were still working on their upcoming album Conspiracy. Biggie continued to grow commercially and status-wise in 95, releasing highly successful singles and remixes. And he was just about to put out his junior mafia group album. This one was supposed to put on some of his people, including Little C's and Little Kim. Park cut ties with most of the people who were part of the Thug Life movement and left it all in the past. On April 26th, Tupac's album Me Against the World went platinum after just one month. The single Dear Mama went platinum as well on July 13th. The album had sold 240,000 units in the first week and it only took an additional month for it to reach a million. Ready to Die, on the other hand, sold 57,000 units in the first week and had reached the milestone of a million copies sold on March 14th, the same day Me Against the World came out. So Park's album went platinum almost six times faster than Ready to Die, as it took Biggie half a year to finally reach a million sales. And Big had already outsold all of Park's albums prior to Me Against the World. So these two were going head to head, with Park being in the lead again. This was really a relief for him, as he was worried about getting left behind by Biggie, cause he would get closer and closer to Park's record sales with the release of each single. Biggie had a platinum album out before Park. Park's first album to go platinum was a second one. It got certified on April 19, 1995, meaning a week before Me Against the World. So Park had now two platinum albums. Big had the luxury of promoting his album with tons of remixes, music videos, shows, interviews and TV appearances, while Park was locked up behind bars. All he could do is watch one of his own soldiers try to overtake him and take his spot in the game. Using his own success formula and blueprint, Big started wearing clothes from luxury brands, like for example Versace shades, an expensive clothes that you would see Tupac wear in 94 he would turn more and more into a player. Park felt like Big was living and rapping about his life, saying that Big was never a player until Park showed him the way. So he wanted his props and at least a thank you. He also wanted Puffy to bail him out. He thought that would be the least he could do after helping Biggie to become a superstar. In May 95, a state judge knocked down Park's bail from $3 million to $1.4 million. So Park got excited thinking that Puff and Big would bail him out and sign him to Bad Boy Records. But they didn't make a single step in his direction. Actually, the opposite happened. They got even closer with the mastermind of the Quad Studio shooting, Jimmy Henchman. And Park took that as them picking the side of his enemy and abandoning him. 
Cause on May 2nd, which was about half a year after the Quad Studio incident, Little Sean released the single Dom Perignon, which not only contains a biggie sample in the hook, but he's also featured in the video next to people wearing henchman shirts. Biggie was celebrating with people wearing Jimmy Henchman's merchandise. And Jimmy was managing Little Sean at the time. So Puff and Big made business with him. They were still cool with Jimmy after the shooting. Which was one of the many reasons why Park believed that Big might have been part of the setup. Park was told that Jimmy Henchman was invited to numerous parties of Bad Boy Records. Popping bottles with Biggie and Puffy. Why would you still be cool with him when Stretch told you about Jimmy being behind the shooting? I mean, Jimmy and his people were sending his mother death threats. Puff himself said that he's not beefing with Park, but that Park is beefing with someone else. And he knew exactly who he was beefing with. He knew that Park and Jimmy were beefing. And he was totally fine with it. On May 30th, they then released the song Player's Anthem, which was the first single of the Junior Mafia album Conspiracy. And it became a hit, went gold on September 7th that year. And Park was really bothered by Junior Mafia being more successful than his Thug Life movement. He would tell his homies from prison to shoot music videos without him, to promote the album. Cause the album wasn't selling much, while Biggie's Junior Mafia was going gold. And it seemed like Biggie had made a wise decision to not join Thug Life but instead create his own movement. And Park was obviously bothered by it. Then on June 6th, 1995, Biggie released the One More Chance Stay With Me remix with his wife Faith Evans, which peaked at number 2 on the Billboard Hot 100 and topped the Hot R&B Hip Hop Songs chart. It was the highest debuting single of all time and went platinum in just a month, which made him appear on the cover of the Source magazine in July 95. And he got crowned the King of New York. This made Tupac very upset. He thought, how can you be the king of New York and not know who shot me? You had all your people there and had the building surrounded. Park felt like as the king of New York, he should have been able to find out who did it. He was mad at him for not informing him. And even if he didn't know beforehand, Park assumed that as the king of New York, his people have to have told him about the robbers and the mastermind behind the setup. Cause everyone who's lower in rank is giving him info. He is the guy everyone reaches out to when there's an issue. At least that's what Park thought the King of New York title meant. And Big had all his people there. So as the King of New York, he must have heard about it. Somebody had to know something. Park felt betrayed by his own soldiers. He expected Biggie to maybe not tell him who did it, but to help him find the people who were responsible for it, so that they can talk it out or settle it. Biggie was cool with Jimmy but didn't reach out to Park. At least not to talk about the incident. People you think know. I just got out of jail and was like, just because I got shot on the East Coast, I'm like, the East Coast, yeah. you know. Uh. Half the rappers from the East Coast was there when I got shot. Nobody knew it then. That's just like you come into the hood and the police ask them what happened mm -hmm. and everybody's like, I don't know. You know they lying. Mm -hmm. And all I was doing was like, give me my proper etiquette. Mm -hmm. if Biggie was out here on the West Coast. He was in the studio with me and we homeboys and he got shot. No, I wouldn't tell him who did it, but he would want, I wouldn't go ride him who did it, but he would want to know who did it. Uh -huh. And I'd be like, look, man, he's from Watts did it, Wound, this is why, they want to talk to you, where, where, where. That's how I do it. Just like when the from the 60s wanted to get stretched. I went to them personally and talked to them. Not only did Big become the King of New York, but he also made an appearance on the new double album of the King of Pop, Michael Jackson, which was released on June 20th. He rapped on the song This Time Around, which became one of the singers of the album. So the king of rap and the king of pop on one song. That's how it was marketed. How did Big go from one of Tupac's soldiers trying to make a name for himself to being on a song with the king of pop? In just one year. Pac became bitter and thought that he would end up like the rap legend Slick Rick, who had to spend five years in prison, which slowed down and ruined his career. Everyone who was inspired by him and everyone who was around him all his homies, partners and underlings continued to grow using Slick Rick's name, while he himself as one of the biggest faces of the 80s started to disappear into the abyss of irrelevance. Park was afraid that the same thing would happen to him. I mean, he was facing one and a half to four and a half years. He was afraid that Biggie and Stretch, all the people he helped to become famous, would use him as a stepping stone and outgrow him while also using his name, style, ideas and sound to get on top. 
all while Park's career is at a halt. Cause Park was really the one that made everything possible for them. With him being a movie star and successful rapper. Someone that was generous enough to give all his homies a platform. And he felt like Stretch and Big were ungrateful. As they wouldn't even pay him a visit while he was locked up. He sent Biggie a message to meet him in prison. So that they can talk about who shot him. But Big never came. He kept sending him messages instead. While also shouting him out on the radio. In the interview with Sway, Park explained how he felt about it. I got shot, I'm like, yo, what happened? Come see me in jail. Biggie all in the air, talking about, yeah, Park is my old boy, boom, but not see me. My old boy Stretch is going to Biggie's concert. This is like abandoning me. But all in the air and on TV, they're like, yeah, Park, rest, you know, keep the struggle on. I was like, yo, I'm starting to turn into like Slick Rick. Mm -hmm. This is just gonna act like I'm gonna just be in jail and they're gonna give me shout outs and try to take my position. And if you watch, that's what Biggie did. He also talked about it in the 96 Vibe interview. Study why I would be mad. Study why I be, would be mad when half of New York, half of the major New York rappers, or they, or they managers, or they agents, or they somebody was there when I got shot, and nobody could give me no information. Just study that. On July 10th, Puffy, Andre Harrell, Jimmy Henchman, Stretch, Little Sean, the assault victim Ayanna Jackson, and Biggie all sent letters to the Vibe magazine in response to Tupac's comments in the April 95 issue. It seemed like they were moving as a unit, all on the same team against Park. Cause Bai put all their statements in the August 95 issue with the headline Tupac Under Fire, the saga continues. Tupac versus everyone that was there during the shooting. They were baiting him. Park spoke on this in the 96 Vibe interview. Them cowards waited about four issues before they got their story together. Four issues later, half of New York is commenting on me getting shot. And before, they was all like, we didn't see nothing. Everybody that was involved knows what happened. And everything is there. If people, if you got a brain, just read everything over. And read my reply, read their reply, read what people say. Watch people. Because you can fake for a long time, but one day, you're going to show yourself to be a phony. He found it odd how they all phrased their letters in a similar way as Jimmy Henchman. Using the same phrases, words and ways to ridicule him. As if they all had a chat together after the shooting and thought of a smart way to respond to Tupac's accusations. Even Biggie used the same words as him to describe Tupac's behavior at the Quad Studios. And Big wasn't even there at the 8th floor. He still said that he was acting like he's in the movie, being overdramatic after the shooting. The same descriptions. He couldn't have possibly seen Tupac's reaction after the shooting. All he saw was him getting carried into an ambulance. Everything else came from different sources. Biggie just repeated the same words Puffy, Andre Harrell and Jimmy Henchman used to describe Park's behavior. Cause they were the ones saying that Park went into movie mode after getting shot. They downplayed everything and ridiculed him. Jimmy Henchman even said he's believing the movie scripts that he's played. Biggie on the other hand said everything was a movie to him. And Big wasn't even there. He just repeated Jimmy Henchman's statements. The fourth issue when they came back with a reply, everybody knew what I did, they knew what I said, I was acting, who gets shot five times and acts? Puffy and Andre Harrell said the same thing. But big statements upset him the most. Cause he was on the same page as Jimmy Henchman. Prior to the release of this article, Puck had announced that he's done with hip hop. He wanted to stop rapping. But these statements in the magazine really convinced him to team up with Death Row after initially refusing Shook's offer to join the label before getting locked up. Cause Shook wanted Park on the label since 93. But things didn't work out even though they would continue to do business together. Like Park appearing on Death Row soundtracks or doing remixes together. But let's take a look at some of the comments in the article. In response to Park saying that nobody tried to help him after he got shot, Puffy said, Nobody turned their backs on him. People was all up on him. Immediately. Andre was like, Oh my god, call the ambulance. Tupac wanted to go to the phone. So me and my man Groovy Lou was by his side. Trying to hold him up. Getting him to calm down. He was telling Groovy Lou to roll him a blunt. He definitely brought the theatrics to it. So Puff was basically saying that Park was acting, being overdramatic and lying in the interview, using the same angle as Jimmy Henchman and Biggie. Then he continued saying, 
he got a lot of people in a lot of BS with that interview. The way it was written, it was open-ended. Like me and Big and Andre had something to do with it. I would never, ever purposefully try to hurt no next man. The man had his own beast with people. I never had no beef with that man. This right here is proof that Puffy knew that the Quad Studio incident was not just a random robbery and a coincidence with Park being in the wrong place at the wrong time, with robbers going at a random target. This was a setup and planned attack. He said the man had his own beef with people. So according to Puff, the shooting was a result of a beef with a certain someone. So he just exposed himself. Cause he's still hanging out and teaming up with the same person that set him up. Again, what led to the robbery was Park's beef with Haitian Jack and Jimmy Henchman. Jimmy hired the three robbers to go at him. And Puff continued working and being cool with Jimmy. Even after writing this letter. Admitting that it was because of a beef with Jimmy Henchman. Puff did not distance himself from him. Nor did he show sympathy or loyalty to Park. Neither did he reach out to Park to confirm who did it. So he wasn't just an innocent bystander who wants justice to be served. He didn't care about any of it. And he wouldn't have ever made a step towards Park in an attempt to help him get his justice. Instead, he continued showing support to Jimmy. So people should stop acting like Tupac had no reason to see Puffy as his enemy. With the robber Dexter Isaacs saying that Puffy knew about the plan before the robbery happened, and Puff making this statement in the Vibe magazine, we have more than enough reason to think that Puck's worries, suspicions and accusations were justifiable. Cause everyone tried to make it seem like Puck lost his mind. People also say that this was a New York thing. The unwritten rule to not snitch on people. Even if the information is not given to the police but to your own friends. People from New York excused Puff and Big's behavior. Saying that what they did was normal. And that Puck didn't know about this no snitching rule as he didn't grow up in New York and wasn't really accustomed to the culture there. So once again a coastal thing. Park explained that if he was in Puff or Big's shoes, he would have offered to arrange a meeting between the victim and the perpetrator. Meaning the guy that got shot and the guy who set him up. And he thought that was the right thing to do for them. But people have said that that's not a common thing to do on the east coast. That it's more of a west coast thing. On the east coast, people try to stay out of it and shut up about it. At least that's how the people around Biggie explained it. And Park had no clue. It must have been a culture shock to him. In response to Park saying that Thurg Life is dead, Puffy said, I really hope that this Thurg Life ish is really over. But on the real, if you're gonna be a mother effing Thurg, you got to live and die Thurg. You know what I'm saying? There ain't no jumping in and out of Thurgism. If that's what you choose to do, you got to go out like that. I know Thurg. Only Thurgs I know is dead or in jail. Or about to be. So, yes, I did say Thug Life was dead. Yes, I bowed out, all of that. But when they said that, they breathed new life in me. Yeah. And Thug Life not only became a rap group, but it became a way of life for life for me. Puffy's statements were similar to what Jimmy Hedgeman said. Where he went wrong was when he tried to go to the street. And when it came down to the test, he did not hold up. He's gonna assassinate people's character saying that people was crying and falling to the floor like a sack of potatoes. It just goes to show that the real coward and the real guy that was crying was Tupac. So Jimmy was defending Stretch here. Cause the part about dropping like a sack of potatoes was a comment that Park made to belittle his friend Stretch. And Jimmy is the same guy that used Stretch to send Park threats calling his mother to intimidate them. But now it seemed like Jimmy and Stretch are on the same page, coming together to comment about Puck. And he took it as Stretch joining the people who set him up. The robber Dexter Isaacs suggested that Stretch sent Jimmy messages to inform him about Tupac's whereabouts, while they were on their way to the court studios. But Stretch's brother Majesty denied it, and said that they never had anything to do with him. Stretch made similar comments as Puffy and Jimmy as well. Park was talking all that ish about Thug Life as ignorance and telling people names and all that ish. I don't even understand why he went there. I've seen Park mad times after the shooting and he never kicked none of that ish to me. You know how he feels about the media. So why would he go and do an interview like that? He's supposed to be a street guy. 
he should have kept it in the streets. I mean, people had to go and get their names changed. I want him to get a reality check. Recognize what the F he's doing. People on the street live by rules, man. And that rule right there, that's the rule that's never to be broken. The fallout between the two officially happened after Tupac made those statements in that Vibe magazine interview. Stretch got mad at Park for saying that he and the other two people that were with him dropped like a sack of potatoes when they got ambushed, even though Stretch is 6 foot 8, the tallest guy that was present that night, quote unquote towering over them. Park was expecting the robbers to go directly at Stretch, since they usually go for the big guy, but they went for Park instead and Stretch followed their orders, instead of fighting back or helping Tupac to shoot them. Park saying all this ish in the interview like, I thought that Stretch was gonna fight. He was towering over them. Now that guy know I ain't never going out like no bee. But I ain't dumb. I ain't got no gun. What the F am I supposed to do? I might be towering over them, but I ain't towering over no slugs. Tupac got shot trying to go for his ish. He tried to go for his gun and he made a mistake on his own. But I'll let him tell the world that. I ain't even going to get into it all like that. Park's talking about people dropping like a sack of potatoes. How the F is he going to know if people drop like a sack of potatoes if he was turned around to get his joints? He tried to turn around and pull the joint out real quick. But people caught him. Grabbed his hand when it was by his waist. Me personally, I only heard one shot. I didn't hear four, five, six shots. And he was saying he got shot three, four times. None of us remember hearing four or five shots. When the shot went off, that's when we went down. Oh, I didn't get shot five times in their vision. I only got shot once because they found the bullet. So what is this other shit in me then? What was the doctor talking about? How did I get girl piling all over me? They got sim different, different accounts of what happened and I'm the one with the bullet wounds. Think back. Did you think about all the people that, that you seen me put on stage? Think about all the people that I put on, that I got into this game, that I showed how to do this. Mm -hmm. And think about what they saying now. That's not keeping it real. So Stretch was upset when he read the interview, and Biggie felt the same way. In the Vibe article, he said, When I read the interview, I felt like he was just ishing on everybody. I always said that he was the realest guy in the game. I don't know what he was trying to hide, or he was scared. I don't know what was going on in his head. That I want to apologize. First thing I found out what really went down, that he shot himself. I figured that with the issue was talking in the vibe, he was just confused more than anything. You get shot and then you go to jail for something you ain't even do, that could twist the guy's mind up. People saying I set him up and I'm the one that got him shot. They're saying that my record, Who Shot Ya, is about him. That ish is crazy. That song was finished way before Tupac got shot. People was taking little pieces of the song and trying to add it to the story. And that ish is crazy. Other people look at the vibe piece like, Damn, Little Caesar was on the terrace, he must have been the lookout man. And it's real people in the streets thinking, That's effed up, what Big did to Tupac. I think that should be erased. Never ever in life. As far as with me, he always gonna be my man. Even when I go see him again. But he need to just check himself. And I want an apology. Cause I don't get down like that. Stretch said some positive things about Park too. Me and Park have been down from day one. Before he did Juice. Before his first album. That's my man. So the interview he did in Vibe bugged me out. But I know him. He likes to talk a lot, especially when he's upset. He'll say ish that he won't even mean. And then he'll think about it later and be like, damn, why the F did I say that? Tupac also spoke about the Vibe article with Sway in 96. What made me do the death row thing, because I was really going to quit rapping. But then Puffy and Biggie and all of them came out in the vibe and they lied and they twisted the facts. And all I wanted to do was end everything and walk away from shit. You know what I mean? Like how Scarface and all them. Dude, I want to get out the game. I go to jail for a crime. Everybody know I did not commit. Get shot five times and I'm getting 
in jail, woonty, wonky, they just say anything to assassinate my character. I'm trying to get out the game. They want to dirty up my memory. They want to dirty up everything I worked for. So it made me come back. Instead of quitting, it made me come back more relentless mm -hmm. to destroy my what, what, what in fact is my comrades. Mm -hmm. To destroy what, what used to be my homeboys. My, mm -hmm. What I worked for. My closest clique. They disrespected me, my name, my family, what I had been through. They said that I couldn't be in pain. I could not feel. I could not be hurt. Big and Stretch said that they want to meet him and talk it out. But during the entirety of those eight months Park was in prison, they never paid him a visit, even though he supposedly told family members and friends to inform those two about his request to talk to them. But they were instead going to parties together. Park was hurt and disappointed. Majesty later clarified that the reason why they couldn't visit Park in prison was because he and his brother had no ID. And with no ID, you're not allowed to visit people in prison. Park of course didn't know that, and thought that they're purposefully abandoning him. All he knew is that Stretch was pretending to talk to him in prison, so that he can hit on Park's ex-girlfriend Desiree Smith. She talked to Stretch in a club about losing contact with Park, gave Stretch her number in hope that it would reach Park. According to Desiree, Big Stretch called her saying he had a message from Park as if he went to prison and spoke to him, even though he never reached out to him while he was locked up. Stretch then turned up at a place with people from Junior Mafia and Bedford Avenue. He tried to sweet talk her, and she later told Park that he tried to sleep with her, after delivering no message from him. With everything she was hearing about Park, thinking that Biggie had something to do with the Quad Studio incident, she thought it was fishy that Stretch would be hanging out with Biggie's crew. She then contacted Park by the way of letters saying, This your boy, what's he doing with your enemy's peoples? And why he trying to holler at me? Stretch hung out with Biggie all the time. Just like Jimmy Henchman, he was invited to numerous bad boy parties. They would always hang out together and make fun of Park for shooting himself, saying that it was Park's overreaction that got him hurt, that there was only one shot, which actually came from his own gun. And Biggie told him that he now understood why they hid the gun in the piano. And Biggie was holding on to Park's gun. He still had it and was hiding it from the police. So they were joking around that Park was hiding the truth. That he was in movie mode and spreading lies. Majesty said that they wanted to visit Park in prison to argue with him. And to address some of the things he said in the Vibe magazine about him dropping like a sack of potatoes. But unfortunately he couldn't. The whole time Stretch thought that everything was fine between him and Big. So when Park said, Stretch switched sides, that's what he meant. After the Quad Studio shooting, Stretch got closer to everyone that was present that night, except Tupac. He didn't speak to Park while he was in prison. But Park apparently still spoke to Big after the shooting. And that's why Stretch thought that everything was fine. He didn't even know that Park had changed his mind about the bad boy camp until he read about it in the Vibe magazine. So he just continued being cool with them, thinking Big is still cool with Park. But they continued giving Tupac shoutouts here and there, even if they never came to visit him in prison. Like for example in the 19th issue of the Canadian magazine Peace, where Biggie was interviewed and asked to rate rappers on a scale from 1 to 10. This came out right around the time he made those disrespectful comments about him in the Vibe magazine calling him an actor and a liar. Park get busy. People can't take nothing from him. On the lyrics, he get busy. Straight up. That guy got some hard-ish. Dog for real. And it's like the sad thing about it. When he started working on his new album he's got now, Aaron Bale, he had so many raw East Coast producers in ish. Big is talking about the Me Against the World album which was called Out on Bail during earlier stages of the recording. So this was an old interview from 1994, but they published it a whole year later, which made it seem like Big is giving Park a shout out in the middle of their beef, after the whole back and forth in the Vibe magazine. The ish was sounding real tight, cause everybody always says Park had lyrics but his beats was whack. He was up in New York when he was working on Above the Rim ish, and he was working on his album at the same time. I put him on to Moby. I put him on to LG. He has action. Special ads DJ. He had some hard-ish. He went back to the west and just started getting back into that other-ish. 
Park found it weird how they would continue giving him shoutouts while at the same time trying to destroy his image, painting him as a liar and actor in the Vibe magazine, while also not coming to speak to him face to face. So the lack of communication between both sides caused Park to assume the worst and create this false image in a set that Stretch and Big were his enemies, when in reality everything was a misunderstanding, at least the part about Big's involvement. But Puffy was definitely informed about it. And Big would have always defended Puff no matter what, as he saw him as a savior, comparing him to Jesus Christ. He took me out of a dangerous game, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I was selling drugs real hard, you know? When I got the record deal, all that got cut short. So it's like he Jesus to me, you know what I'm saying? Because he just saved me. And it's real. And I go all out. Now I ain't saying none of that. I'm not Jesus. To Jesus. Me, I look at him like, Jesus. I say Jesus. And the uh, next question you know, is, <laughs> watch out for the thunder out this mall. <laughs> he nah. saved me. So Big had Puff's back the same way Puff had Jimmy Henchman's back. And the same way Jimmy had Haitian Jack's back. Stretch and Big backed each other up as well. It didn't matter if Big was involved or not. His actions after the shooting were already enough. So Park was done with all of them. Meanwhile, Suge Knight, the co-owner of the record company Death Row Records, went through his own share of problems with Puffy and Bad Boy. He used to look out for Puff in the early 90s, when he was just an a &R at Uptown Records. And even after starting his own record company, Shulk helped Puff wherever he could, most of the time for free. Puffy used to come out to California and Shulk used to look out for him, for free, as Puff couldn't afford security at the time. But now Big was starting to take over the game and Bad Boy became a million dollar company. Biggie was one of Shulk's favorite rappers. He wanted him to perform at a location he was promoting. But Puffy expected Shook to pay money for it, even though Shook had always looked out for him for years, done everything for free. Puffy didn't care and refused to do it for free. Biggie was killing it at the time. The Source magazine had crowned him the king of New York, and the West Coast didn't really have an artist that was on his level at the time. They had no one to compete with him. And there was a lot of pressure at the time, with everyone saying that the East Coast is taking over. Dre just came out of jail and had to start from scratch. He was starting to work on his new album but lost his loyal ghostwriter the DOC, who had just left the label for not getting paid enough. And Dre had to cancel his collab album with Ice Cube called Helter Skelter. So now they were left with nothing. Snoop Dogg didn't have anything in the vault that's worth releasing. And it was clear that the Dog Pound album they were working on at the time wouldn't come anywhere near the chronic doggy style or ready to die. So Death Row, the face of the west coast, had nothing. While Big is breaking one record after another. Winning all the awards, doing group albums, doing remixes that are topping the charts, being on the cover of every magazine. All while the people from Death Row were going through all the legal problems. With Snoop's murder case and Dr. Dre's house arrest. Biggie and Puffy were taking over and Shook Knight got jealous. And he also felt like Puffy did him dirty. He was mad about it. He knew that Dre and Snoop, who were currently the main artists on Death Row, weren't on Biggie's level at the time, at least rapping-wise. So Shook was looking for someone new. A rapper that could outperform and outshine Biggie and Bad Boy. So that Shook can get his revenge and continue looking down on Puff. It was all ego. The rapper Shook was looking for was Tupac who was currently in prison. He wanted to teach Puff a lesson. So he got in touch with Puck and together they exchanged their frustrations and hatred for Biggie and Puffy. They were now in the same boat, had the same motives, the same mindset, the same enemies, the same level of hatred for them. And the two already knew each other through their collaborations prior to Puck's incarceration. The death row record deal Puck almost signed in 93 before deciding against it and his appearance on various Death Row soundtracks, like Above the Rim for example, and also Murder Was the Case, although they ultimately left his song off the album. They paid him regardless, knowing that Puck is short on money, because of all the legal problems. So Shook always loved Puck, who on the other hand tried to keep a healthy distance from them, as he knew that they meant trouble. Puck and Death Row were like fire and gasoline, a dangerous combination. 
But with him being locked up, potentially for the next 4 plus years, he had no other option but to join the label. He was filled with anger, rage and hatred, and quote unquote sold his soul to the devil by signing to Shook Knights, the tyrant of the rap industry, who wanted to bail him out and give him a 3 album contract. Together they thought of a plan to destroy all their enemies on the east coast. Park was on board and Shook wanted to end Puffy's career by all means necessary. He wanted to destroy the label Bad Boy and replace it with the new label branch Death Row East as the face of East Coast Hip Hop. He wanted to sign all the artists that Puffy was working with, including Biggie, after humbling him and giving him no other option but to come to Death Row. The plan was to sign all the big talents on the East Coast, so that Puffy had no superstar to work with anymore. That's why at the 95 Source Awards, which took place on August 3rd, Shug went on stage and dissed Puffy by inviting artists from all around the world to join his label, while saying that they don't have to tolerate a guy like Puffy dancing in their videos and ad-libbing every single one of their songs. Any artist out there want to be an artist and want to stay a star and don't want to, don't want to have to worry about the executive producer trying to be all in the videos, all on the record, dancing, come to death row. Puffy was sitting in the audience when Shug made those comments. This was really the first time he made the beef public, by ridiculing him on stage and taking the legendary bad boy and death row rivalry to the next level. He even shouted out Tupac, indirectly announcing that he'll become a member of the death row family. That same night, Big E once again proved to everyone that he's a problem. He won four awards in just one night new solo artist, lyricist, live performer and album of the year. A year prior, the West Coast had dominated the Source Awards, with Dre and Snoop winning in most categories. But this year, Biggie stole the show. He was the biggest thing in hip-hop, so Shug once again got jealous. Puffy was once again feeling himself with Biggie being on par with the entire Death Row label cause he was getting the same amount of awards as the entire Death Row family combined. And that really bothered him. Which is why Shook made those comments out of nowhere. I couldn't believe what he said. I thought we was boys, Puffy said. He later came on stage and responded to those comments while also speaking about the East-West War. I'm the executive producer that a comment was made about a little bit earlier. But con check this out, contrary to what other people may feel, I would like to say, that I'm very proud of Dr. Dre, of Death Row and Shook Knight for their accomplishments. And all this East and West that needs to stop. The East-West conflict wasn't anything new, but this incident made everything worse. Shook's words spread like flu germs, reigniting ancient East-West hostilities. Biggie being the winner of the night infuriated everyone from Death Row. The people from the East Coast started booing them every time they went on stage. To the point that Snoop Dogg had to speak up. The East Coast don't love Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg. The East Coast ain't got no love for Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg and Death Row. Y'all don't love us. Y'all don't love us. They went through similar problems a year prior. Cause the East Coast crowd was upset about Dre and Snoop winning all the awards. That was the same award show where Tupac rushed the stage in the middle of the A Tribe Called Quest victory speech. He rapped the song out on bail with dozens of his homies on stage, making Q-Tip from A Tribe Called Quest cry and pissing off the East Coast audience. New Yorkers felt disrespected by Park interrupting their speech cause they were just giving a shout out to all the pioneers of hip hop and it seemed like he did it on purpose. Not only that, but the east coast audience was upset about the west coast rappers winning more awards than east coast rappers. There were arguments going on behind the scenes and rappers from the west coast didn't feel accepted in New York. And this only got worse a year later in 95. And things got worse behind the scenes. More specifically after the award show. Shug Knight supposedly slept with Puffy's baby mama Misa Hilton that same night. 
trying to piss him off even more. He would always go to all of Puffy's and Biggie's shows together with his people, trying to intimidate him, showing off his Ma Peru gang ties in an attempt to humble him. Puffy then realized that it was too dangerous for him to come to LA. Not doing shows and promoting his music on the west coast would once again slow down his money, so avoiding the west coast was not an option. He saw how Shug always had about 50 to 100 gang members with him, wherever he went, ready to go to war on his command. Flying to LA with a security team of 50 men, 50 bodyguards wasn't an option because it was way too expensive. It wouldn't have even been worth doing all the shows in LA if the costs are that high. So he was forced to do what Shook was doing the whole time. Get close with one of the biggest gangs in LA to get their support. That was the cheapest and most efficient option for him. Puffy thought it was a smart move for him to get in touch with the Crips, especially with the Southsiders. They had a history with Shook's Ma Peru. They were enemies. With the help of his good friend Eric Von Zip, Puffy got in touch with the Southside Crip Keefy D, the guy who was in the Cadillac the day Tupac got shot and killed. Keefy D and the Southsiders were now accompanying Puffy and the Bad Boy staff every time they came to the West Coast. They became his personal security and were 20 to 40 deep at all the shows, trying to keep Shook's Ma Piru in check. Puffy pitted them against each other so that there is a west coast internal conflict in the middle of the east-west war. More on this in my Tupac murder documentary. On August 15th, Tupac wrote a letter to his ex-girlfriend Desiree Smith while he was in prison, telling her about his divorce from his wife Keisha after being married to her for three and a half months, cause Park had gotten married while he was in prison, but it unfortunately didn't work out. At the bottom of the letter he wrote, be careful. The Walking Dead, Jack Agnes, rest in peace, Todd, rest in peace, Jimmy Ace, rest in peace. Those are the people Park thought were responsible for the Quad Studio shooting. Haitian Jack, King Todd, who he thought was one of the shooters, and Jimmy Henchman. He also wrote Bad Boy Killer at the bottom right, sharing his plans of wanting to destroy Puffy's label Bad Boy Records. He put everyone that was present at the Quad Studios on the hit list. Not only them, but also everyone that was involved in the Ayana Jackson assault case. And also the ones that were part of the bad boy camp. Park scratched out the names of Little Sean, Biggie, Puffy, Jimmy Henchman, Haitian Jack, his friend Trevor, aka Rick, who was the guy that evaded arrest during the incident with Ayana Jackson, Andre Harrell, Craig Mack, who's another rapper from Bad Boy Records that had nothing to do with the shooting, also King Tut, who Park thought was a shooter, and his best friend Big Stretch. He had a lot of time to think about it and to watch the moves of every single one of those people on the list. Park wanted to get rid of all of them. On August 29th, they finally released the Junior Mafia group album Conspiracy, which ended up being more successful than Tupac's group album Thug Life, going gold in less than four months. It took the Thug Life album about a year and a half to reach that milestone. And now the group was history. While Junior Mafia was making headlines, which might have been a punch to the gut for Tupac, since he wanted Biggie to be part of the Thug Life movement, who on the other hand chose to start his own movement instead, and it worked out perfectly, at least commercially, cause Thug Life was the overall superior rap group, but people at the time were feeling Junior Mafia way more. To be fair though, Park didn't really have the opportunity to promote his group and the album as he was in prison. Biggie, on the other hand, had great promotion. The next big incident occurred on September 23rd, 1995, when Ma Peru member Big Jake from Campanella Park was gunned down after attending the Platinum City Club, a nightclub based in Atlanta. It was actually Jermaine Dupri's birthday party. Both Shug and Puffy were invited. Jake was there as a bodyguard for Shug. The two are homies. And Shug was of course there to intimidate and bully people especially Puffy. As mentioned earlier, Shook was always showing up to parties and clubs that Puff was attending to make him feel uncomfortable and to humiliate him. Shook supposedly slapped both Puffy and Jermaine Dupri, even had Puff in a full Nelson. At the after party, someone from Puffy's camp, either his bodyguard Anthony Wolf Jones or a man named Jason from the Bronx, shut down Jake after an argument. 
Mourn this in my Tupac murder documentary. Shook wanted revenge for Jake and blamed Puffy for his death. Shook yelled at Puffy and promised retaliation. This was the point of no return and Puck was just about to inherit all the beefs Shook had as if he hadn't had enough enemies and problems already. Now he was in the middle of a gang war with the mob Peru wanting revenge. After the Atlanta shooting, people on both coasts began speculating. Would there be retribution? All out war? According to a New York Times cover story, Puffy sent Louis Farrakhan's son Mustafa to talk with Shook, which Puffy denied. But he did tell him, if there's anything you can do to put an end to this BS, I'm with it. The Times reported that Shook refused to meet with Mustafa. He had declined to speak about his friend's murder. Less than two weeks later, when the How Can I Be Down rap conference in Miami took place, the heat was on. Shook, who has never concealed his past affiliations with LA's notorious Bloods, was rumored to be coming with an army. Puffy was said to be bringing a massive group of New York thugs and drug lords. When the conference came and Puffy did not attend, Billboard reported that it was due to threats from death row. Then on October 12, 1995, which is less than three weeks after the shooting, Tupac, the guy who Shook wanted to bring back to crush Puffy and Bad Boy Records, was released from the Clinton Correctional Facility in New York. After serving eight months on abuse charges, he was on a $1.4 million bail and signed to Shook's label Death Row Records. He became heavily involved in the growing East Coast-West Coast hip hop rivalry. Park was already labeled a Thurgan gangster before his release from prison. But signing to Death Row amplified it to the point where everything got out of control. He finally had his chance to get everything off his chest and get back at everyone, unloading all the hate and resentment he had built over the past couple of months. To the horror of the music industry, Tupac publicly accused Biggie of setting him up. Big denied any involvement in the shooting saying Park had simply been the victim of a botched robbery. But Park refused to back down on his accusations. He was just filled with hate, anger and rage. He had lots of time to think about who shot him and wonder whether his friends were really his friends. Park had endured enough. Now it was time for payback. Expect me, nigga, like you expect Jesus to come back. Expect me, nigga, I'm coming. <laughs>